We'll go ahead and get started here in just a moment, so please find your seats. Okay, good morning. It's uh, so fantastic to see you all. I'm in that awkward position of breaking up what feels like a family reunion precisely to host a family reunion. So, no, it's so great to see everyone just in conversation with smiles and joyful here today and, and a full room to boot. Uh, this is really a joy to be hosting this event. I am Greg Johnson. I'm director of the Walter H. Capps Center for the Study of Ethics, Religion, and Public Life here at UCSB. And all right. Thank you. Uh, it is really a humbling honor to be in this position to honor someone's legacy uh, of this magnitude. I didn't know Walter myself personally, but I was, uh, let's say, subjected to his genius in graduate school by way of a very large book on the history of religious studies. That's how I came to know him. And I came to appreciate that not only uh, did he contribute in so many primary ways to the discipline of religious studies through his own research, but he was also the master storyteller of the discipline, that he told us who we are, where we came from, and the various possibilities for what we could do, not just theoretical work, but also practical work. That side of the equation, the practical, didn't always land well among colleagues, uh, too political, too engaged, so forth. Uh, turns out it had staying power, uh, that the academy on its best day does go that direction, uh, and the CAP Center, it's our mandate to do just that, and I'm proud to be in a position to help in a modest way uh, move that agenda forward. So we have two days in front of us. I'll be brief here, by the way. Two days of celebration events. Um, obviously, today we have the value of the humanities panel now. Then we'll take a lunch break, and you're all invited to join us. We'll have a number of box lunches. And then at 1 PM, we'll resume with a star-studded panel of former students of Walters to talk about their work in religious studies and cognate disciplines. Then there is a public reception in the same space immediately following. So please join us for all of that. Tomorrow we move to Campbell Hall, the site of the legendary Vietnam course and the stranger course. Now, understand this up front. We don't expect to fill Campbell Hall. If we do, <laughs> hooray for us. It's not that we're wildly out of touch with, say, demography, weekends, and things like that. But when we consulted uh, Lois and Laura about where best to host such an event, uh, immediately that was the reaction. Let's go to the space where the magic happened, as Laura put it. And so that's where we'll be all day tomorrow uh, for several sessions about the famous classes and then winding up, then segueing after lunch to a session with Alessandro Duranti, who did remarkable work doing a video ethnography of Walter's campaign in 96, and we'll share footage and remarks about that. And then our final panel on the value of public, the ongoing value of public life with uh, the Caps family and uh, Senator uh, Bob Carey, and special guest appearance by Lou Cannon. And, that will, and then followed by another reception. So two days that should be joyous. The weather is cooperating with us, so this is a delight. Uh, to have the family in the room with us is such a, a special thing. Um, I'm, I'm just delighted you're here and that you've participated in making this happen. And the same for friends and colleagues. Uh, 
without fail as we reached out to people, would they like to be involved? It was all we needed to know about the legacy of Walter Capps that everyone said yes right away. Uh, just fantastic. A special thanks to my friend and colleague, um, Professor Mazuzawa over here. This is in part her inspiration. At a meeting a year and a half ago, she said, surely we're due to celebrate the legacy of Walter Capps. And I said, surely we are, and uh, won't you help me reach out to folks? And she did just that, and so thank you for that uh, dose of inspiration to get this moving. A few other thank yous. This event really would not be taking place were it not for Associate Director uh, Dusty Hosley. Dusty, where are you? Uh, a number of people have prematurely congratulated me on the success of this event, but to the degree that it exists at all and will be successful, this goes to Dusty. He has done so much work, as has our student assistant, Leilani Calkins, and our many volunteers. Thank you all. Um, thanks also to our donors who helped build the center in the first place and who continue to sustain it. We are very grateful. Also to the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center uh, and Susan Derwin, uh, who directs that center, uh, for enabling us to be in this fantastic space and to host a most appropriate conversation here. Just a couple notes on upcoming events. In the winter, the CAP Center is delighted to host a, a few things of note. In January, we are hosting, uh, in conjunction with Health Humanities and Legal Humanities, uh, a scholar from uh, Berkeley Law School, Kiara Bridges, who works at the intersection of critical race theory and reproductive justice. This is timely, it's urgent, it'll be a banger for sure, please come out. February, Lerone Martin from Stanford University will be speaking to us about uh, state surveillance of black religion, another urgent topic, so please come out for that. Then in March, we have Phil Gorski from Yale University, a sociologist of religion, helping us better understand currents in contemporary uh, Christian nationalism and related issues. Uh, before I turn to introducing the panel, uh, <clears throat> a land acknowledgement. As you know, we are on Chumash land, and we're not speaking in the past tense here, we're speaking in the present tense, and in a future tense, this is a Chumash place, or at least should be understood as such, um, and we wish to honor that. In this, in this building, we're not only on Chumash land, we're with Chumash ancestors. This building hosts the repository for the Central Coast for Ancestral Human Remains, and that is not a light topic, that's a serious topic. The university is now doing very good work to make good on the responsibility to house and repatriate those remains, and I'm proud to be part of that effort, and I hope that it continues and continues to be funded in important ways. So, uh, so the gravity of this space is real in a way I think that Walter Capps himself would really appreciate and, and help us understand for that matter. For this panel, The Value of Humanities, it is my pleasure to be able to introduce uh, our Dean of the Humanities and Fine Arts here at UCSB, uh, Dinah Berry. Dr. Uh, Dinah Berry is Professor of History and the Michael Douglas Dean of Humanities and Fine Arts here at UCSB. She came to Santa Barbara in August 2022 after serving as the Oliver H. Radke Regents Professor and Chair of the Department of History and Associate Dean of the Graduate School at the University of Texas. She is an internationally recognized scholar of the enslaved and a specialist on gender and slavery and black women's history in the United States. She is the author and editor of six books and numerous scholarly articles. Uh, Dean Barry completed her BA, MA, and PhD, and some serious fast running, if I understand, in African American Studies and U.S. History at the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dinah Barry. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. He was making a side remark because I ran on the track team at UCLA, so that's what he meant by fast running. 
But it's wonderful to see everyone here. Thank you so much for coming out on this uh, holiday um, to honor one of our esteemed former faculty members. Um, I want to introduce our Executive Vice Chancellor, but before I do, I want to just say a few things about the humanities and the fine arts here on campus. Um, I'm, as he mentioned, only been here for a year and a few months, and I just launched my vision for our future about a week ago, and one of the main pillars of our area of focus are the public arts and humanities, so I think it's very um, telling that we're here having those conversations as well. So David Marshall is Professor of English and Comparative Literature and the Executive Vice Chancellor here at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He has been the Executive Vice Chancellor since 2014. He previously served for 16 years as Dean of Humanities and Fine Arts and was the first Michael Douglas Dean of Humanities and Fine Arts. And he, was, he served in that role from 2005 to 2012. He was also the executive dean of the College of Letters of, of Science, uh, Letters, excuse me, the College of Letters and Science. Executive Vice Chancellor Marshall previously was a professor of English and Comparative Literature. I would say he still is, <laughs> not was, he still is. Um, and I, I would say that um, because he always is uh, finding nice ways to help us with our word choice, our sentence structure, and some of our, our memos that we write. He's, he's like, I don't know if I would use this word. I'm like, oh, I've learned lots of words from David in the last year and a half. Um, um, EVC Marshall was, as I as, is a professor of English and comparative literature, and he served there. He was at Yale University as well, where he taught from 1979 to 1997, and he also served as the director of the Whitney Humanities Center. From 2008 to 2022, he was a member of the board of directors of the National Humanities Alliance, including serving as president of the board of directors from 2014 to 2018. Please welcome Executive Vice Chancellor Marshall. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here, and it's, it's a wonderful occasion. Um, there's a lot to say. Um, thinking back on my own story here, uh, as Dino was, was mentioning, I actually was recruited to be Dean of Humanities and Fine Arts um, in 1998. Um, and I'd spent almost 20 years in the world of the private university, and what attracted me here was, in part, uh, the idea that the University of California was a great public research university. And I knew at the time that the Department of Religious Studies had a national reputation for its interdisciplinary and comparative approaches to the study of religion, its focus on American religion, and its public-facing and public-focused uh, programs. And among these uh, were the Vietnam and Voices of the Stranger courses that Walter Capps had created to bring students in the university into dialogue with voices and stories that were not being heard anywhere else at the time. Now, Walter Capps had died nine or 10 months before I came to UC Santa Barbara, although I do remember that I was introduced to him downstairs in the elevator here in 1996 when I was visiting uh, the IHC, but I, I never knew him. But in 1998, I soon found myself in conversation with Richard Hacht, who was then the department chair, and Clark Roof, who became department chair in 1999, as well as with many colleagues and many community members about how the campus could honor the legacy of Walter Capps. And the question from the beginning was not how to memorialize an esteemed colleague with the naming of a scholarship or, or a lecture series, for example. The question was how we could rise to the occasion, live up to the legacy of the work that Walter Capps represented. Now, what was remarkable about that time was how broad this conversation was about the legacy of Walter Capps. And it included the Capps family, uh, who have always supported us while pushing us beyond our academic comfort zone to think in new ways about how we could bring academia to the public sphere and bring public issues to the academy. 
Uh, it included members of the Santa Barbara community, many of whom became very generous uh, supporters. And in 2001, the department and La Casa de Maria sponsored a three-day conference uh, called Acts of Service, a conference on religion and public life honoring the legacy of Walter H. Capps, at which Senator Bob Kerry spoke. And the conversation included other public figures and public intellectuals, such as Representative David Price, Gary Wills, Martin Marty, Bill Moyers, E.J. Dion, uh, who came to campus to speak to us and to the community. Now, I want to pause here to acknowledge the incalculable contributions of Professor Wade Clark Roof, who served for 15 years as the founding director. There's inspiring music coming up <laughs> as, I'm, as I'm remembering Clark Roof. Um, uh, uh, Clark was the founding director of the CAP Center, and he served for a remarkable um, 15 years. He was the J.F. Rowney Professor of Religion and uh, of Religion and Society, and as many of you know, Clark was a major scholar of the sociology um, of religion. Uh, he also, by the way, oversaw an annual summer institute for the U.S. State Department that brought international scholars, civil servants, journalists, NGO leaders from over 80 countries to learn about religious pluralism and diversity in the United States. And I know Kathy Moore was involved with that, and I recall Lois speaking at that sometimes, too. Um, like Walter Capps, Clark modeled engaged scholarship in the humanities and the humanistic social sciences that addressed crucial issues in society and public life. With the expert assistance of Leonard Wallach, who became the first associate director of the CAP Center in 2003, and support from our development colleagues, Nicole Clanfer and Leslie Gray, who are here today, Clark worked to implement a vision of a center that would include curricula, student internships in local nonprofits and, and government, and extensive public programming. And these events introduced students and the public to academics, public figures, policymakers, journalists, business leaders, all of whom enlarged and enriched a public sphere in which important questions about ethics, morality, and religion could be discussed and debated. And Clark and I spoke about the CAP Center at meetings around the country. And I still remember in 1999, we went to the University of Michigan to attend one of the first Imagining America gatherings. And UCSB became a founding member of that organization, which has championed public scholarship ever since. Now, I'm not here today to give a history of the CAP Center, um, but I want to think back to the origins um, it was officially launched in 2002 and was called the Walter H. Capps Center for the Study of Religion and Public Life, but it was soon renamed the Walter H. Capps Center for the Study of Ethics, Religion, and Public Life to more fully reflect Walter Capps' vision and, and legacy and to acknowledge that religion was part of a broader dialogue about the value and the values of the humanities in the public sphere. And in recalling the center's origins, I want to set the stage for a discussion about the public humanities and the importance of public investment in the humanities. Now, insofar as this is an origin story, I want to emphasize the unusual statewide and national resonance of Walter Capps at that time and the crucial support that we received because of a broad investment in his vision, an investment that went far beyond the campus. In 2001, as we were discussing what a CAP center would look like, we received $100,000 in seed funding from the UC Office of the President. And then in a highly unusual earmark, the United States Congress, with not only bipartisan support, but what's unthinkable now, unanimous support, um, allocated $500,000 to the Department of Education uh, to support the center. 
Now, Clark Roof and I, along with Nicole Clanfer, attended a reception on Capitol Hill to recognize the award. And I have very vivid memories of this. Nancy Pelosi made moving comments, not only about Walter, but also about Lois, who she suggested had been brought to Congress through Walter. And I will always remember how the congressional staffers in the room started whispering to one another when Representative Steny Hoyer suddenly appeared on the podium with Nancy Pelosi and introduced her with effusive praise. Now, Pelosi had rather recently been elected the House Minority Whip in an upset over her longtime colleague. And this, it turned out, was the first time that they had appeared in public together, and this was seen as a dramatic reconciliation and display of unity. And the symbolism of that moment was very clear to the House insiders. And in fact, the Washington political publication, The Hill, actually had a column about this reception two days later with the headline, Burying the Hatchet. And it described the event as a stunning, spontaneous moment. But it was clear that it was not entirely spontaneous. The occasion was not a coincidence. Walter Capps had brought together those two rivals in an embodiment of collegiality and civility. And as Lois Cap suggested when she was interviewed by The Hill, and I went back to do some archival research on this, um, this moment represented the legacy of Walter Capps. Now, in July of 2021, Chancellor Yang and I traveled to Washington, D.C. to meet with Bill Ferris, who was then the chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and we met with him in his office in the historic old post office building, which, believe it or not, was later sold by the U.S. government and turned into a Trump hotel. Um, <laughs> Bill Ferris was a folklorist who was also known for generating bipartisan support for the humanities. And he had actually been our humanities and fine arts commencement speaker the preceding June. I remember that I had to go out and get a guitar so he could play a blues song as part of his commencement speech. And he invited Chancellor Yang and I to come to the NEH to talk to the senior staff about our humanities programs. And when we discussed our plans for the CAP Center, it became very clear that Walter Capps was known and deeply admired at the NEH, not only for his work at UCSB, but also for his service as chair of the California Council for the Humanities, president of the National Federation of State Humanities Councils, and for his NEH-supported Summer Institute for high school teachers and college teachers on topics that related to religion and public life in America. And our meeting at the NEH led to our submission of of a proposal uh, for an NEH challenge grant. And eventually, after peer review, it resulted in a $500,000 award in 2002. And we met and exceeded the requirement to raise 1.5 million in matching funds within the five-year period, thanks to the extraordinary support of the Santa Barbara community. And this included donors who knew Walter and Lois, but also donors who just wanted to invest in the vision of ethical and civic engagement represented by the CAP Center. Now, I want to emphasize here this government support, governmental support, and the National Endowment for the Humanities in particular, because arguments for public investment in the humanities and liberal education in this country, and the role of government in supporting the common good are more important today than ever. Now, I was president of the National Humanities Alliance, which advances uh, national humanities policies in the area of research and education, preservation, and public programs um, in 2016 and 2017, when the newly inaugurated Donald Trump asked Congress to eliminate the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Endowment for the Arts. And by the way, its funding ended up being increased thanks to bipartisan support. And at the time, I went back to read the explanations that the U.S. Congress offered in 1965 in passing the National Foundation on the Arts and Humanities Act that created the NEA and the NEH. 
it's interesting to think this was one year after Walter Capps became the second founding member of the new Department of Religious Studies at UC Santa Barbara. I think it was the first in a public university. And President Johnson in 1965, remember, who declared a war on poverty as part of his great society, argued for the need to attack the poverty of man's spirit. And it's really interesting to know how often that word spirit comes up in these discussions. Now, according to that National Foundation on the Arts and Humanities Act, and I'm gonna read some sentences from that, while no government can call a great artist or scholar into existence, it is necessary and appropriate for the federal government to help create and sustain not only a climate encouraging freedom of thought, imagination, and inquiry, but also the material conditions facilitating the release of this creative talent. The world leadership which has come to the United States cannot rest solely upon superior power, wealth, and technology, but must be solidly founded upon worldwide respect and admiration for the nation's high qualities as a leader in the realm of ideas and of the spirit. And in the words of Congress, and I'll read one more quote, an advanced civilization must not limit its efforts to science and technology alone, but must give full value and support to the other great branches of scholarly and cultural activity in order to achieve a better understanding of the past, a better analysis of the present, and a better view of the future. And then in words that I imagine Walter Capps hearing in 1965, democracy demands wisdom and vision in its citizens. Now these words from 58 years ago have their origins in the principles that we've inherited from the founders of the American Republic. And by the way, I'm reminded of a description that Lois gave of Walter's decision to run for Congress in her memoir, uh, Keeping Faith in Congress. And she wrote, his head was filled with Jeffersonian ideals and the lessons of de Tocqueville, the subject of a summer course he had taught to high school students through the National Endowment for the humanities, and she also noted that he hearkened back to what he had read of the founding fathers and envisioned himself returning to the classroom with a real story to tell after serving in Congress. The 1965 Act's argument that the federal government has an educational mission that includes support for cultural heritage and artistic and scholarly expression reminds us of what we have inherited from the American Enlightenment. Now, the 1780 Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which, by the way, was authored by John Adams, states that wisdom, knowledge, as well as virtue, and I think when they said virtue, they meant what we would say ethics, diffused generally among the body of the people are necessary for the preservation of their rights and liberties. And as these depend upon spreading the opportunities and advantages of education in the various parts of the country and among the different orders of the people, it shall be the duty of legislatures and magistrates in all future periods of this commonwealth to cherish the interests of literature and the sciences. And these words are actually echoed in the 1879 Constitution of the State of California, which declares a state-supported and autonomous University of California to be a public trust and affirms that a general diffusion of knowledge and intelligence is essential to the preservation of the rights and liberties of the people. Now, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, all the other thinkers who participated in that enlightenment experiment of the American Republic argued that education was necessary to the preservation of the Constitution, democratic culture, and the rights and liberties of the people. And they focused on public education and liberal education, what we today would call the liberal arts and sciences and the humanities. 
And in 1790, in his first annual message to Congress, President Washington argued that the promotion of science and literature was necessary to the preservation of a free constitution. And in both his first and last addresses to Congress, Washington made many arguments for the importance of promoting what he called the flourishing state of the arts and sciences. In 1778, in an oration that was delivered on the second anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, the South Carolinian statesman and historian David Ramsey rhapsodically predicted that the new republic and the arts and sciences would flourish together and that the arts and sciences will be cultivated, extended, and improved in independent America. And he was echoing the philosopher David Hume, I think, who asserted that it is impossible for the arts and sciences to arise at first among any people uh, unless the people enjoy the blessing of a free government. And Ramsey writes, our free governments are the proper nurturers of rhetoric, criticism, and the arts, which are founded on the philosophy of the human mind. And he anticipates that the free governments of America will produce poets, orators, critics, and historians equal to the most celebrated of the ancient commonwealths of Greece and Italy. Extrapolating this philosophy of the human mind from Hume and Shaftesbury and Addison, 18th century American writers argue for the improvement of the mind. And Ramsey declares that eloquence is the child of a free state because arguments about laws and policies are enforced by the art of persuasion. The rising patriot, he writes, therefore, who wishes the happiness of his country will cultivate the art of public speaking. And contrasting British government, which tended to crush the exertions of the human mind, he said, with American government in which all conspire to fan the sparks of genius in every breast, Ramsey anticipates what Samuel Harrison Smith describes in a wonderful phrase, the collision of mind with mind in his discussion of why liberal education is best suited for a Republican form of government that must depend upon the general diffusion of knowledge and the capacity to think and speak correctly. And this is finally an argument about uh, the relation between what we would today call democracy and what we would today call the humanities. It is also, in some ways, a good description of a liberal arts education in which the improvement of the mind and the effort to fan the sparks of genius in every breast to increase knowledge and the capacity to think and to speak take place in a community founded on dialogue, argument, and this collision of mind with mind. Now I'm reminded here of the statement that Walter Capps often quoted from John Dewey, democracy begins in conversation. The humanities are fundamental to our rights and liberties. The humanities are central to our democratic institutions because they can teach us how to think, how to talk to each other, how to listen to each other, how to argue with each other without rending the fabric of our community. And Walter Capps understood that the humanities were central to this conversation because they taught people how to tell their own stories and how to listen to the stories of others. Now, today, I fear that even Walter Capps, as both a professor of religious studies and as a member of Congress, would be challenged in our current moment when the national political dialogue seems paralyzed and when horrific events in the Middle East have led to a breakdown of community on many college campuses. Yet more than ever, we need to learn from Walter Capps' lessons about democratic institutions and his insights into our need to move beyond silence, trauma, and division to create the dialogue and the community in which we can listen to each other and create a space in which to hear the voice of the other. This is also what the humanities can teach us. So I look forward to more conversations that I think will continue many of these themes. Thank you.
So we have a, a great panel to, uh, to begin um, today. Um, and uh, we've brought together some very important national humanities leaders who have special expertise in state humanities councils and who also have a good knowledge, uh, as you'll hear, uh, of the contributions that Walter Capps made. Um, unfortunately, James Quay, who's the former executive director of the California Council for uh, the Humanities, had a, a family emergency and can't be with us, but he sent his, his paper, which I believe Ralph uh, will read. And so we're going to hear from Ralph Lewin, executive director of the Peter E. Haas Jr. Family Fund and former president and CEO of the California Council for the Humanities, and Phoebe Stein, president of the Federation of the State, Huma of State Humanities Councils, and you have their bio, so I'm not going to say more than that. So we'll begin with their uh, talks, and then we'll have time for questions and discussions after that. So thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see everybody here on such a beautiful day. Um, you know, Jim Quay can't be here, and he's very sorry about that. I had a chance to talk with him. Um, and I'm sorry for it for a number of reasons, one of which he began his career in radio and he has such a beautiful radio voice. <laughs> um, but he also has a, a beautiful heart and a beautiful mind that I think you'll, you'll feel as I read this. I retired from the California Council for the Humanities more than 15 years ago. So I think any reflections on the current state of the public humanities are best left to Phoebe and Ralph. But as the elder member of the panel, I'd like to offer some background and history of the public humanities and their value that I hope will be helpful. You could make the case that the public humanities began when the pre-Socratic philosophers first spoke in Greek agoras two and a half millennia ago. But institutionally, the public humanities are a recent phenomenon. Four years after its own creation in 1965, the National Endowment for the Humanities created its Division of Public Programs. Two years later, NEH, not quite as ceremonial as the... <laughs> <laughs> NEH provided funds for experimental humanities councils in six states. In 1977, the Federation of State Humanities Councils was formed, and by then, there were humanities councils in all 50 states and Puerto Rico, the District of Columbia, and four American territories. That the intended audience for these humanities councils was the public was demonstrated by the mandated structure of the board. Half were academics and half were public members. When reviewing proposals, academic members would scrutinize the humanities content and the participating, schol and the participating scholars. Is the project intellectually coherent, are the participating scholars appropriate? The public members would scrutinize the project's structure and appeal, who will come? Why should they come? I found this blend of state council boards quite wonderful though. Sometimes, though sometimes it could feel a little bit like introducing people from foreign countries at the United Nations. I particularly enjoyed when an academic member would take me aside and say, you know, these public members are really quite intelligent. Or a public member would take me aside and say, you know, these academic members, they're really quite approachable. <laughs> these asides suggest that the board members came from worlds that didn't often associate with one another. But there were times when I also felt there, were, there was a disassociation between the academics and the public humanities. Here's an example. When the Federation of Humanities Councils had its annual conference in San Francisco in 2005, I was asked to comment on a paper about a conference entitled The Aspen Summit on Rethinking the Public Humanities that had been held the previous year. I discovered the scholar writing the paper had called the conference The Aspen Summit on Rethinking the Humanities. I think his dropping public from the title was a telling omission. For most of the paper, the author talked about the humanities, and when he finally got around to talking about the public humanities, it was clear that what he meant by the public humanities was the academic humanities in public spaces. Are the public humanities simply the academic humanities in public spaces? This is a natural assumption. 
Many earlier directors of humanities councils began their careers on campuses, and we thought our work as bringing the humanities from the campus to the public, from the towers to the trenches, as we used to say. The public humanities then and now use the principal vehicle of academic humanities, a lecture followed by questions from the audience. Common formats used in public humanities projects derive from the lecture, museum exhibit, exhibits, a kind of visual lecture, for example, or documentary films, also a kind of lecture. On the other hand, it didn't take long to realize that humanities projects in public spaces had to be a great deal more interactive, more personal, more participatory than the usual classroom lecture. In public formats, we had to ensure there was a connection with and full participation of the audience. Otherwise, the public would not come. Public humanities projects are electives, after all, not required courses. Let me say that emphasizing personal connection and audience participation are not exclusive features of public humanities projects, but they are championed by the academic humanities as well. But they are essential to the public humanities. I'll close this portion of my presentation by describing the public humanities format that was born in state council practice rather than adapted from the academy. It's called the Chautauqua. A Chautauqua performance has three parts. For the first half hour, a humanities scholar speaks to the audience in a persona of a historical personage. Wearing the appropriate dress and using first person testimony like diaries or letters if possible. In the second, he or she answers questions from the audience as the historical person would have answered them. In the third half hour, he or she offers comments to and answers questions from the audience about the person they portrayed. So one of the first most accomplished practitioners was Clay Jenkinson, who portrayed Thomas Jefferson. As Jefferson, he offers his opinions and accomplishments. Inevitably, in the second half hour, he is asked about Sally Hemings. He denies all allegations, as Jefferson did all his life. In the third half hour, however, Clay cites the evidence we now have regarding Jefferson's relationship with Miss Hemings. The historical figure has his say, but it's not the final say. In Chautauqua, the text becomes a person, the interaction personal as well as critical. And I can tell you, it's a powerful experience. I remember choking up when telling a scholar portraying Henry David Thoreau how grateful I was for his essay on civil disobedience. Not every public project can offer this powerful and personal experience, but I offer it as a quintessential example of what public pro humanities projects seek to achieve. Now I'd like to turn to the question of the value of the humanities. In 1969, I read an essay by literary critic George Steiner entitled, To Civilize Our Gentlemen. Please forgive the antique language. In that essay, Steiner wrote, I find myself unable to assert confidently that the humanities humanize. Indeed, I go further. It is at least conceivable that the focusing of consciousness on a written text, which is sub is the substance of our training and pursuit diminishes the sharpness and readiness of our actual moral response. He posited a controversial figure, the literate Nazi who destroys Jewish lives during the day and reads his Goethe at night. At the time, I was working in central Harlem as a conscientious objector, anguished by my country's war in Vietnam and hoping to become an English professor. Steiner's challenge haunted me. Since then, I've experienced academic humanities courses and contributed to public humanities projects that I hope and believe were humanizing. But the most powerful answer to Steiner I have ever encountered was that of Walter Capps and his Vietnam class. I first met Walter in late 1982, a few months after the unfinished war, Vietnam and the American Conscience was published. I was a humanities producer for California Public Radio, and I had a particular interest in this book and its author. Our interview came just weeks after the dedication of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, and I'd been powerfully moved by the reading of the names, which was part of the dedication. During our interview, Walter told me about the class he was teaching at UCSB in the Religious Studies Department. He told me that he had asked veterans, journalists, nurses, and politicians to bear witness to their experience in Vietnam. 
I asked him if he had ever invited a protester or a conscientious objector to speak to the class, and he paused before saying, no, he hadn't. Six months later, through a series of small miracles, I was hired as executive director of the California Council for the Humanities, and as it happened, Walter Capps was the incoming chair. It was the beginning of our close professional association. In 1985, he invited me to tell my story to his class, the story of how I became a conscientious objector to that war. Telling my story to his class was an experience I will never forget. One repeated in following years, I came to love and admire Walter, not because he was an inspirational teacher and a renowned scholar of the humanities. I envy you who have had the pleasure of knowing him in those roles. But what I loved and admired about Walter was that he was a true practitioner of the humanities. By that, I don't mean that he was humane or humanistic, though he certainly was both, but to practice the humanities is to seek out stories about the lives of others, living, dead, fictional. To practice the humanities is to talk with others about those lives and the way their stories are told or not told. To practice the humanities is to ask what these lives tell us about what it means to be human, what they mean to us today. Walter's course modeled this practice and in doing so answers Steiner's challenge. He enabled them to hear the cry in the streets and not just the cry in the text. Walter's course was not formally a public humanities project. It was held on campus, this campus. But through that course and its sequel, Voices of the Stranger, Walter brought people and their stories from the margins of society and the very, into the very heart of the university. His students did not meet Vietnam veterans or disabled people as objects of study, but as human beings to be heard talked to, encountered, and ultimately cared about. I think the genesis of the course tells you a lot about Walter and about his practice of the humanities. Walter was a fellow at the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions and in 1977 became its program director. The center, which had hosted many workshops on the Vietnam War while it raged, decided that it should do one last workshop on the war, now that the war was over. Walter looked down the list of prospective invitees and noticed that the list included not a single veteran of the war. This was in 1977, barely two years after the war's ignominious end. Ignominious, sorry. <laughs> and no one, not one, was talking or listening to Vietnam veterans. Walter started calling around and located Shad Me Shad. And Shad, who had started the first Vietnam Vet Center by going down to the Santa Monica Pier and approaching men who had a certain look in their eyes, which identified them as veterans, Walter persuaded Shad and another veteran, Frederick Downs Jr., to come to the workshop. For most of the first day, the articulate policy experts talked and talked about the war. The two veterans were silent. Walter tried to draw them out, but it was difficult. Finally, during a break, they told Walter that they couldn't talk about the war the way everyone else was. That's okay, Walter said. Tell it in your own way. After the break, Fred Downs began by driving the hook at the end of his right arm down onto the polished conference table and declaring, I can't talk about the friggin' war this way. He then told the startled audience about the Vietnam War he had experienced. What Walter heard that day was so searing that he knew that the war was not finished, not in any way that was important to the soul of the country. So he decided to teach what became simply called the Vietnam class and decided that the main substance of the course would not be lectures, but first-person testimony of people who had participated in the war. The university and its department were not immediately supportive but in 1979, he was allowed to offer the class as an experiment. The response, as we know, was stunning. By the time I spoke before his class in 1985, the course had to be offered in Campbell Hall, which seats nearly 900 students. A 1984 poll had found only 44% of incoming students thought developing a meaningful philosophy of life was a worthy goal while 70% thought being very well off financially was important, 
a reversal of the results from the 1968 poll. Yet there they were, 800 plus students. I guarantee you, no student ever took Walter's class because she thought it would help her make more money. <laughs> By their own testimony, students had their, li had their lives changed by Walter's class. And I would claim, to use Steiner, Steiner's term, they were humanized. I offer both the Chautauqua and Walter's Vietnam course to you, not as models all humanities courses and public humanities projects can follow, but as to my mind, the most powerful example of how the humanities can humanize by inviting us, by enabling us to exercise our moral imaginations. I want to close with three short snapshots that illustrate Walter's effect on people and then end with a poem. Oh, Todd, I'm going to need your help with this. Can you make kind of a, a tuba sound when I point to you? Where's the last tuba? Uh, uh, this, uh, this is on you, sorry. Ready? While he was chair and I was, ex yeah, like that. When, while I was chair and I was executive director of the California Council for the Humanities, we would have a weekly phone call. One day I called when Walter wasn't home and heard something unexpected. Hello, this is Walter Capps. <laughs> it was Walter playing the tuba. I can't come to the phone right now. <laughs> tuba sound. <laughs> <laughs> But leave a message and I'll call you back. Thank you, Todd. <laughs> On my flight home from Walter's memorial service, a flight attendant saw the poem I had written on the seat next to me and asked, is that for Walter? Not Congressman Capps, not Professor Capps, Walter. Yes, I said, Walter's the only person I've ever voted for, she said. You know, not against the other guy, but really for. Did you know him personally? I nodded. I'm really sorry, really sorry. Later that day, driving home from San Francisco airport, I approach a stoplight and I see a middle-aged guy on the median strip with a sign, Vietnam vet will work for food, please help. This time, I don't put on my, I don't see you face and stare out the windshield. I pull out a couple of bucks and offer it to him. Good luck, brother, I say. The guys fill, my eyes fill. Now the car behind me offers him something. Maybe the car behind him. That's for you, Walter. I thought, that's for you. That, I would submit, is an example of practicing the humanities. In the days following Walter's death, I could not bear to write a poem about Walter, which I felt would turn him into an object. So I wrote a poem to Walter. I have altered it slightly for today to honor and connect with his presence, a presence I still feel. And here's the poem. I and thou to Walter Capps. Walter, it's me, Jim. I wish I could hear you say, hey, Jim, the way you always did. Walt, so many of us wish we could hear you again. It's dark, it's a dark time, and we miss that glow that always surrounds you. You walk into a room, and everyone just glad to see you. You didn't have to say a word. That would be honor enough to shine the way you did, make people a little better by your very presence. But you did more. You took your light into dark places, places we wanted to forget, hiding places for the people we wanted to forget, and the war we wanted to forget, places that reeked of death and anger and deep despair. You brought a lot of people back with you, students wondering what their books were for, veterans wondering why they were still alive, AIDS victims wondering what their dying could possibly mean, you heard the voices of the stranger, Walt, and you made it possible for us to hear them and showed us that there are no strangers, only neighbors, neighbors we hear or choose not to hear. You shared your lectern with so many of us and gave us a chance to find our voices, and now we are suddenly all the voice you have. And today, you have made us neighbors again, and we are here celebrating you, but also grieving for you and the loss of your good heart and your great soul. Many years ago, in my job interview, remember, 
you asked me, do you have any heroes? Now, how like you is that question? Open, inviting, quietly powerful. When I'd ask it in all my interviews, I would think of you. That day I answered Martin Buber. I haven't been asked since, but Walter, if I'm ever asked again, if I have any heroes, I'll answer Walter Capps. You, Walter, you. Thank you. All right, that was my Chautauqua performance. I am no longer Jim Quay. I am Ralph Lewin. Um, thanks for bearing with me. Um, Jim's, uh, uh, as you'll hear, is a great friend, a mentor, and uh, part of that lineage, uh, uh, Walter Capps, Jim, uh, I feel so honored to be a part of. So here's my story. To begin with, let me tell you a story of how I met Walter Capps. It starts when I moved in the second grade to September Street in a neighborhood called Claremont in San Diego. Claremont was one of those neighborhoods built in the 50s to house people working in the military industry, places like Lockheed Martin, Convair, and General Dynamics. On and around the corner from September Street lived many of my buddies, Georgie, Alex, Cindy, Bodes, Rod, Michael. We were a gang of rascals who would spend our days building forts in the canyons, playing hide-and-go-seek among cars in the driveways, and roller derby in the cul-de-sacs. Most of our parents in the neighborhood were former military veterans of World War II, Korea, the Vietnam War. But like most of America, we didn't talk about the war experiences. It was a silence that hovered over where we lived, that maybe exploded at the neighborhood Fourth of July party when someone had too much to drink, or could be felt in a deeper, unsettled existence at the dinner table. Well, unlike most of my high school graduating class, I decided to leave San Diego for Santa Barbara, one paradise for another. Among the first people I met at UCSB was Todd Capps, smart, hilarious, an incredible musician and artist, a powerful surfer. He was one of those people you hope your kids meet when they go to college. Todd soon introduced me to his family, his amazing sisters, Lisa and Laura, his wonderful mom, Lois, and of course, Walter. And this was in 1985. And I remember meeting Walter, and after talking for a while, playing some basketball, I remember his impossible to defend hook shot, maybe listening to him play tuba for a minute. You don't have to do it this time. <laughs> and he might have said, hey, Ralph, did you hear that one about Ole and Lars? The one about them taking the train? I probably said, no, Mr. Caps, I hadn't. Well, they were taking the train and brought along some bananas for lunch. Just as they began to peel them, the train entered a long, dark tunnel. Ole asked excitedly, hey, Lars, did you eat your banana yet? Lars said, no. Well, don't do it. I just took a bite and went blind. <laughs> Walter would tell those kind of jokes. And he'd just kind of chuckle, and he'd just kind of look at you, kind of like, hey, Ralph, did you get it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I soon after learned about that class that Walter taught, the class where he brought in all kinds of people to talk about the thing that couldn't be talked about on September Street. He pulled back the curtains to reveal that our parents... I'm sorry, I'm just laughing about the banana joke. <laughs> That's just him. Um, uh, he pulled back the curtains to reveal what our parents, our teachers, our friends, our society wouldn't talk about. The Vietnam War, filled with its history, stories, the humanity, the inhumanity, the moral decisions that shaped the country we inherited in ways we didn't understand. He created not just a safe space, but a brave space. A space where veterans like Shad and Bob Carey and conscientious objectors like Jim Quay could tell their stories alongside one another. I remember walking to Campbell Hall, or I was probably skateboarding, for the first day of class, and kept asking myself, why would 800 students sign up for a religious studies class? It made no sense to me. 
But I came back to three reasons. One, uh, authenticity. So we recognize the authenticity of the stories that were before us. Two, relevance. The stories really mattered to our lives and to our families' lives and to the direction of our country. And then trust. You walk into Campbell Hall and you just had this sense that we as students had the trust of those presenting their stories to try and help them make sense of those stories. So there's a whole panel devoted to the class tomorrow, so I'm not going to talk more about the class, just to say that it had a profound impact on me and helped me understand the power of stories, the power of listening, and the power of silence. After graduating from UCSB, I waited tables, traveled, went back to school, and eventually in 1992 landed a job interview with the California Council for the Humanities. I remember it was in a boardroom in San Diego, and sitting, who was sitting across from me but Jim Quay, whose story about being a conscientious objector had moved me. And guess which question Jim asked? That's right. Ralph, do you have any heroes? <laughs> well, somehow I answered it. I got the job, and, and Jim not only became a boss but a mentor in life. How lucky. Fast forward to 2012, I'd become CEO of the California Council for the Humanities, and we did a number of statewide projects, one called Searching for Democracy, which had people in standing room only uh, uh, spaces from Fresno to San Francisco talking about the meaning of democracy, the question about what civ role civility plays in democracy. Everybody was very concerned about the direction of our democracy in 2012. Kind of seems quaint now, doesn't it? And then my last project as CEO of the California Council for the Humanities was in 2014. It was called War Comes Home, which explores what it means to come home from war and how we could build bridges of understanding between those who served and those who had not. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? We had over 850 events across California reaching about 2 million people as communities were brought together with veterans and their families and writers and philosophers and historians and local libraries and community centers and homes to think about the aftermath of war, particularly in light of 12 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. We had a lot of events and one was an exhibition called War Inc. It was an exhibition unlike anything else I had seen, talking with veterans of Afghanistan and Iraq about their tattoos, what they meant and what it was to experience war and come home from war. The exhibition went on to be featured in Newsweek magazine, Washington Post, and received the Schwartz Prize for Public Humanities Excellence. Rather than try and explain it, I'd love to play a short clip, and I'm not quite sure how to do that. So Dusty, maybe you can help me. I served in Kyrgyzstan, Iraq, Kuwait, South Korea. A sergeant in the United States Marine Corps, and I served in Iraq. I was a sergeant in the Marine Corps, and I served in Iraq and Afghanistan. for people to talk about Iraq or Afghanistan, but I don't think there have been a lot of chances for veterans themselves to talk about what those experiences were in their own voice in a way that doesn't have a politically charged message. People always want to know when they ask you about like, your experiences and stuff like that. I started to think of tattoos as a way to tell the stories, so I got a soldier's cross tattooed on my back for my friends that died because I carried the burden of survivor's guilt. It's a tribute to those that are no longer here, but it also serves as a reminder to maintain my humanity and the experiences that I've been through, where I am now, and how that's gonna shape who I become in the future. 
hadn't really accepted that I had fully come home. Because I, I knew men who died. And there's a part of me that, that died over there. I feel really alone in this world. I feel like, you know, no one understands and no one gets it. And that's okay, I can deal with that. I feel kind of lost, you know, like it's, like when all of those things that are really important to you all of a sudden disappear, when your path isn't like exactly in front of you like it has been for so many years, then it's easy just to get really lost and kind of question who you are and, and why you're doing anything anymore. It helps the civilian world kind of understand a little bit more about us, that we have thought processes behind our tattoos, behind what we do. The clouds are like the angel rays coming down and it's my feet, they're my Chuck Taylors with wings, so it's like my feet going to heaven. Every day is hard, but kind of just accepted it and just make try to make the best of what I got. I'm not dead, you know, like, I'm always a glass is half full kind of person, so. We're not all crazy. Some of us are hopeless romantics. You know, just most of us are generally just funny guys and ridiculously good looking. And, <laughs> Yeah, people are very quick to judge when they hear military tattoos, which is a shame, in my opinion. Opening communication between veterans and civilians, that, that communication's hard. I'm starting to realize that it's an important thing to do. I feel like there might be one other veteran out there who might understand me. And if that makes them feel not so alone, then this whole project's worth it. And the only sense of family I've ever felt was when I was in the Navy. And it's the most powerful feeling I've ever felt. I feel like I belong. I smiled a lot today. I don't usually smile a lot. It made me pretty happy, and I'm not usually very happy. I felt a little more beautiful than I normally ever feel. I feel like a disgusting person most of the time. Today you kind of took all that away from me. It really meant a lot to me. I couldn't have asked for a better day. You know, that project, I don't think, would have happened without the kind of groundwork that Walter had done and that people like Shad had done, who actually advised us as we did the War Comes Home project. Um, but authenticity, relevance, trust, all represented there. Um, so a final word about the humanities. David asked me to, to talk about the state of the public humanities. As a head of the Family Foundation now for the past four years, I'm not as engaged in the humanities as I once was, but I do have a few thoughts. So in some ways, we're living in the very dark times for the humanities. The humanities are under attack with universities cutting departments, faculty, student enrollments down. We see reactionary and authoritarian forces seeking to ban ideas, books, and restricting and censoring humanities discourse at every level. Make no mistake, this is a serious and calls on each of us to unapologetically make a strong case for the role that the humanities play in our public life. At the same time, we could be at the cusp of a golden age. The humanities have been democratized. Access to an interview with Toni Morrison an analysis of Shakespeare's sonnets or a discussion about the ethics of war are available to most people in a way that they haven't been available in human history. This is both exciting and daunting. In a world where we will continue to struggle with our understanding of truth and lies, love and hate, liberty and captivity, and yes, war and peace, the humanities remain vital and important to us as a society. It's up to us to build the trust and engage authentically in a way that people see as relevant to their lives. 
Walter Capps provides us with one pathway to do this, and the ripple effect on our society has been profound. I guess one question that remains for us in view of the work of Walter Capps is, what are we doing to foster a public conversation rooted in the humanities, and how can we do it better? Thank you. Unlike the rest of the people on this panel um, and many of the people here in the audience, I never met Walter Capps, and I am certain that I am poorer in spirit and mind for that. But I have a strong institutional memory of Walter Capps as a former board member at California Humanities and as a former board member and uh, board chair at my nonprofit, the Federation of State Humanities Councils, or the membership organization for the nation's state and jurisdictional humanities councils. I have learned uh, a lot about Walter Capps and most what I know from, about Walter Capps from Jim Quay's beautiful booklet. Um, I'm not sure if you all know of this booklet, uh, which Jim calls an album. Um, that he published when he was executive director of California Humanities. I uh, brought a copy with me. This publication not only records Jim's memories, but those of Walter Capps' family and friends. The booklet also explains why the Federation chose to establish the annual Walter H. Capps Lecture as the centerpiece of our National Humanities Conference. But though my experience of Walter Capps, the scholar, the public humanist, the husband, the father, and public servant, has been secondhand, I do feel that I have a personal connection to, if I may, Walter. The Capps lecture and thus, the, and thus Walter Capps have always been a part of my professional life. In 1999, the same year that the Federation established the Walter Capps Lecture to honor him, just two years after his untimely death, I stumbled quite literally into a job at Illinois Humanities Council. As Capps believed in the power of stories, I'll share mine very briefly. In 1999, I was one year out of graduate school at Loyola University Chicago with a newly minted PhD in English looking for a tenure track job. I read about the Chicago Humanities Festival in our locally, local weekly Chicago Reader. I don't know if you remember local paper weeklies. And I went to go hear both Sandra Cisneros and N. Scott Mamaday read. I think the price to get in was $3. I immediately started teaching Cisneros's The House on Mango Street in my Composition 101 classes at Loyola and DePaul. And that summer, I called the Chicago Humanities Festival asking if they had any internships, only to be told that they didn't, but I should call Christina Valaitis at the Illinois Humanities Council. I applied to be a summer intern in 1999, and I stayed for eight wonderful years. I attended my first National Humanities Conference and my first CAPS lecture in 2000, just a year after it was established. I'm sorry to say I don't remember what Congressman David Skaggs had to say, but subsequent lectures are bright in my memory. Every Capps lecture embodies Walter Capps' demonstrated commitment to the power of the humanities to transform individual and community life. With the annual Capps lecture, the Federation's intention is to highlight, endorse, and offer as a model the qualities that Walter brought to teaching, his public service, and his day-to-day -day interactions. A belief in the value of dialogue, an ability to evoke and create meaning through the exchange of stories, a belief in the power of the telling of personal stories to create empathetic understanding and desire to act a commitment to inclusion of all voices, and importantly, the promotion of civility in public and private life. In establishing the CAPS Lecture, the Federation wanted to make available presentations that encourage 
public and private commitment to the creation of a more humane and enlightened society. Since I left Illinois Humanities, I've spent the entirety of my career in the Humanities Council community as Executive Director at Maryland Humanities and now President of the Federation. But for many years before I had this job, I was part of selecting the CAPS lecture. So I think about the sustaining Walter CAPS legacy every year. It is not a job that I take lightly, and it is among my favorite projects of each year. So I'll offer some highlights. I had the honor and pleasure of introducing author Azar Nafisi when she gave the CAPS lecture in 2010. And a few years later, when I sat on the committee for the conference in Birmingham, Alabama, I invited Freeman Rubowski to give the CAPS lecture, one of my mentors at Maryland Humanities Council. Rubowski was from Birmingham and a self-proclaimed math nerd of about eight or 10 years old when he participated in Dr. Martin Luther King's Children's March and served jail time as a child after being spit on by Bull Connor. In my memory, that talk stunned the CAPS lecture audience into silence and then into thunderous applause. In 2021, during COVID, our second all virtual National Humanities Conference, I asked Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha to give the CAPS lecture. You may remember she was the pediatrician whose research helped detect the lead poisoning in, in the local water in her patients, in her young patients. And ultimately, her research led to reversing the water flow in the river in Flint, Michigan to remove the, to remove the lead. And just a couple of weeks ago, at the 2023 National Humanities Conference in Indianapolis, before an audience of around 600 people, the 25th CAPS lecture was held. This was a conversation between Alilia Bundles, journalist, author, and great-great-granddaughter of Madam C.J. Walker, and Professor Tyrone McKinley Freeman. These two esteemed humanists connected their work to our everyday lives and the ongoing fight for justice, drawing on their personal experiences and focusing on black philanthropy in America. The event was held in the Madam C.J. Walker Center in Indianapolis, a grand old theater that once denied Madam C.J. Walker entry unless she were to pay three times the price a white uh, person paid to enter. She later bought that building. <laughs> this connection between the personal and the civic, the voices and stories that help us understand not only what it means to be human, but what it means to live together on this planet as humans. That, for me, is Walter Capps' legacy 25 years later. Please know that his legacy is strong at the Federation. We honor his life's work all year as we plan the conference and the Cornerstone Capps Lecture. So what does this all have to do with the value of the humanities today, which is what I'm supposed to be talking about? As both Ralph and Jim emphasized, Walter Capps used firsthand stories as a way to explore the humanities as the texts that were worthy of time and deep engagement. I want to offer some examples of recent and ongoing work by humanities councils across the nation that embody Walter Capps' work as a humanities practitioner. I love that Jim Quay used that word. That focus on stories, healing, change, and connection. For me, this is why the humanities are a powerful tool for directly addressing our challenges, our conflicts, our pain, our incalculable loss that is so resonant in these times. In September, two Pacific Island Humanities Councils, Humanities Guahan and Northern Mariana Humanities Councils, presented a conference called Reimagining the, the Marianas. This was an evening that celebrated self-reflection, storytelling, exploration, and creating meaningful social change through performance and conversation. Importantly, the program featured food, powerful performances by indigenous cultural experts and artists, and a meaningful discussion about cultural identity, resilience, and healing. 
The goal was to create an inclusive and welcoming space in the Pacific where participants could think critically and discuss the values and choices that shape us as a community, or shape them as a community, to reimagine a Marianas that is more just and inclusive and sustainable. Also in September of this year, the South Dakota Humanities Council sponsored a storytelling contest for veterans that culminated with an award ceremony at their South Dakota Humanities Book Festival. Army veteran and festival author Brian Turner announced the winners and held a workshop specifically for the veterans. During an interview prior to his appearance at the 2017 festival, National Book Award winning, Tim winning author Tim O'Brien said, writing about war helps writers and readers find meaning in what happened. And this is a Tim O'Brien quote. The word war is such an abstraction. It's almost meaningless as a word. It's not until it's something specific that it takes on any meaning. And often that's through a story. This program too feels like a direct legacy of Walter Capps. As we look towards the next generation of humanities practitioners, I also see Walter Capps' influence on an Arkansas Humanities Council program called Next Generation Humanities held in downtown Little Rock this coming March, you can attend. This is a first of its kind conference to bridge the gap between the humanities education and careers of young professionals. This is an intergenerational conference that's going to bring together the next generation of humanities scholars and ages 17 through 22, I think, with experienced professionals in the humanities fields. They're going to have resume workshops and mock interviews and free professional headshots and even a clothing closet for folks to have professional um, clothes. I'm going to close with two examples of what the humanities can do in the most dire of circumstances. And I do what Ralph says about the darkness of this moment does resonate with me. I was in Mississippi last week. As all of you know, the, the, I think currently the poorest state in our nation. And I saw the humanities in action. So I'll close with this. First, uh, I attended at Jackson State University. They hosted the 50th anniversary of the Phyllis Wheatley Poetry Festival, first funded by NEH in 1973. The events featured three days of sessions and most importantly, conversations among black women writers. Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, Nikki Giovanni, Sonia Sanchez, Charlene hunter Galt, and Margaret Walker graced the stage in 1973. 50 years later, just last week, Alice Walker was there in person, as was Charlene hunter Galt, and Nikki Giovanni and Sonia Sanchez via Zoom due to health issues. Amani Perry, Nicole Hannah-Jones, and Jackson, Mississippi's own Angie Thomas spoke this year and the conference drew more than 600 people. There were no rental cars anywhere that you could find. Personal stories, history, hard truths, and calls to action about book bans, continued racial, racial violence, and survival filled the auditoriums. I had the honor of visiting two other humanities projects in Mississippi, both with Mississippi Humanities Council and NEH. And these really resonated with me as I was thinking uh, about Walter Capps uh, recently. I was confused by the first visit initially, which was to the Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson, uh, the only medical research center and school in the area. I looked at my agenda. I was due there. I didn't know what we were doing there. Um, so I just sat and listened. We met with the director of ethics there who had been called out of retirement in 2011 when a construction crew broke ground on a new building for the medical center and found human remains. What they discovered was a 12-acre, neatly planned, unsegregated graveyard for the mental hospital that had been there in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. There, were more, there are more than 6,000 graves in 12 acres, most in pine boxes, but with no names. With the support of the state, which is unprecedented, the state of Mississippi gave them $3 million for this project, and support from NEH, they have put together a team of scientists, humanists, to exhume, identify, and lay to rest these remains in a mausoleum nearby. There are archaeologists, philosophers, 
ethicists, historians on this team, and they are working closely with the descendants. This is a project truly with the where the humanities are truly restoring humanity to the mentally ill and forgotten citizens of Mississippi. Finally, I made a visit to Rolling Fork, Mississippi in the Delta, the birthplace of, anybody know? Blues musician, Muddy Waters. You may remember, or you may not, that a deadly tornado ripped through Rolling Fork last March. The population before the storm was about 2,000 people, I believe. Soon after the tornado hit, Mississippi Humanities and a local blues historian learned that the Town Welcome Center, the museum that had some incredible um, Muddy Waters artifacts, including a, um, uh, apparently a vinyl LP from Rolling Stones that was signed by all the Rolling Stones to Muddy Waters, and all the town signage had been destroyed. They were sensitive that lives had been lost, but they asked if getting these signs restored was a priority. They asked the mayor and the local heritage folks, and they said, yes, it, yes, it was. So I figured eight months after the tornado and with FEMA and lots of other help, the town would have recovered. What I saw shocked me. Parts of houses were literally hanging from trees, stripped of bark, the library was still closed, and the bathroom I used in the building in the library was still stripped of its walls and its flooring. The cupola on the town hall was still entirely ripped off, but in the grass beside the trailers that now house the town hall on a sunny day, we unveiled the Muddy Waters Heritage Sign and the Heritage Area Sign for Rolling Fork. What I love is that the historian also took the opportunity to update the text on the signs uh, with this opportunity and make them more historically accurate. Before unveiling, before the unveiling, proud residents gave us a tour, a windshield tour in their car, pointing out all that had been lost and all that would not return, telling their stories. This made me rethink what makes a community. This was a town still very much destroyed. I didn't see anyone, very few people walking on the streets. Well, there are no sidewalks. You might think that no one lived there, but the stories and these historical markers and the homemade sack lunches that we carried home told me that we had experienced the heart of this community of Rolling Fork. And I'd like to think that Walter Capps would smile his very bright smile at that particular moment. Thank you. So thank you for those really rich talks, which had a lot of connections. We have time for questions, comments from the audience, and I guess that because this is being taped, we want people to use the microphone. So I'll ask my colleagues here um, to take these, and I will be glad to call on people. Um, uh, um, Yes, go ahead. Yeah. All right, so my question is to Ralph with regard to the Chautauqua methodology and the world within which we live now where people interact quite regularly with machines. What would Walter say? I don't know. <laughs> um, and uh, on the one hand, I think it's exciting. Um, the idea that uh, you know, we could interact with, say, someone who uh, had fought on the front lines in World War II, or World War I, or the Revolutionary War, and hear their story, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. But then I guess there's also a question about, you know, what do I gain when I hear directly from Shad Mishad about his story 
and I see in his eyes and feel in his heart that story. I'm, I'm not sure, and, uh, and I wonder, uh, uh, I, you're living in this, in this world, Daniel, more than I am. I wonder at what point uh, will technology evolve to where there isn't a difference? Yeah, yeah, it's a great <laughs> question. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, why don't we get more questions sure. in the mix, unless Phoebe wanted to say something about that. So, there was a question back here. Did you have a question? Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, this is more uh, of a response to all the talks. Thank you, everyone who spoke. It was so inspiring and aspirational, and I feel so galvanized. Is that right? Um, I never, I, I'm, I wasn't lucky enough to, to um, have Walter Capps as a teacher. I have many friends who have, and every single one of them have said how transformative he was and how he changed their lives. And even coming up on the elevator to this talk, women in front here, transformative. Um, but I am very lucky to know the Capps family personally and I tear up because clearly Walter's spirit shines through every one of them and they inspire me every day. And um, I teared up through this. This It, it doesn't take much for me, <laughs> but I did. And I just feel so inspired and I just want to thank everyone and uh, to share my love for the Capps family um, and to thank all of you today. This is really special. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes, please. Here's the. This is pretty overwhelming. I'm sitting here with the Caps family. I miss Lisa. I used to sleep in her room for 20 years, even after she left. Uh, on a lighter note, that, that day at Montecito, uh, I ended up meeting Walter through the White House. They had called, uh, I don't know, Walter could call probably anybody in the world, but somehow they referred Fred Downs, who was a, uh, a combat vet that had lost uh, his shoulder and arm, and me, the street dog in Los Angeles, and, uh, and I'd never met Fred. Uh, you know, he's, he was becoming a bureaucrat on disabilities and stuff under Max and Carter, and I'm on the streets of L.A., so we... We convulge at the, the Biltmore. I mean, this, I don't know if it's still around, but I mean, it was like we'd never seen anything like this. And we meet each other. We're, you know, we're both a few years out of Vietnam. He's severely wounded. I'm on the streets of L.A., you know. But when we hit Montecito, where they had set up, I mean, it was like... Uh, Nothing I'd ever experienced. This is this mansion. There's this huge table. They have the video going on. And Fred and I are talking or whatever. We have all these uh, political science legends from all over the world talking about our war. Of course, you mentioned that beautifully in the lecture. And we're sitting here like, what are they talking about? I mean, this is our war. This is none of this. They were talking about it was a good war. It was the righteous. We should have, you know all the political aspects, we're sitting here dealing with our brothers and sisters, and we're looking, and Walter, he, he just magical. He's a magician in a number of things. He knew the timing of when we should come on. We sat all morning, like we're doing today, listening, and then he said, okay, you guys now can tell them about the war you experienced. So we're looking at who's going to go first. And we're sitting, you know, there's microphones there. It's like Camp David. Look, just like Camp David. And this table is like a pool table with this beautiful velvet top, the speakers and everybody's name. We were like strangers in this foreign world. And Walter's got this grin. He's sitting up in the booth above there where they're videoing everything. And Fred looks at me and says, who wants to go first? Because we were like, 
we got to set these folks straight. I said, you go. He cocks this chrome arm shoulder and drills it into that beautiful million dollar table. <laughs> I mean, this iron hand goes in there and, and that's what kicked it off. And he rolled in and I mean, nobody, they didn't even want to ask questions after like you're doing. And then I rolled in about LA and you know, and you know, I look like a, a, a street dog and, and there are all these people from all over the world and Walter was, you could just see Walter was so happy. And that was really when he decided, because I ended up going up every month, staying with the Caps, talking about what are we going to do? We got to da 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 da. I'm just telling the story. And it ended up being the, the war class, Vietnam War class. And uh, I'm, I'm real emotional. I, I know how you're feeling. I look at Lois. I, I see the orange trees. I see all, all the cars. I see everything. I, I shouldn't be saying this, but it was, it's been one of the greatest uh, journeys in my 53 years since Vietnam life it was with Walter and his family mm -hmm. and with the class. Mm -hmm. And that's about all I can say right now. But that, how it kicked off, I see it's still here. <laughs> And everybody looked, and I mean, I could still see the imprint, like, man, are we going to have to pay for this? <laughs> Thank you. And I don't know, if, uh, Daniel, I don't think AI can do that yet. Oh, no, I don't think so. Yeah. And, the, and there'll be a whole panel about the courses tomorrow, too. Um, yes. Hi, thank you very much for this. Um, I wanted to ask both of you to say a bit more uh, about public humanities, and I was struck by the, I think you said the phrase was from the tower, from the tower to, to the, the trenches. trenches. Yeah. That's kind of the older model, is that you just take what happens inside the university, you just kind of dump it out into the world and hope that people uh, have an appetite for it, and that that, that model is out of date. Um, but it strikes me that Walter Capps did pretty well with that model um, and has made a huge impact through his teaching just in a traditional university classroom. So I, I guess I want to offer a bit of a challenge and say how, how, how can we think about public humanities stepping into new models but also not lose what worked really well in the case of Walter Capps. <laughs> So much, yeah, thanks so much for the question. Um, well, just, you know, it should, should definitely be said that there's no public humanities work without the scholars being trained, you know, in the universities and colleges in terms of, um, you know, I, I think that's just that uh, coming together. Um, and I, you're right, the dichotomy of the tower and the trenches and then, the military metaphor and all of that. I, I, I think really um, what we're talking about here is yes, definitely the teaching, uh, you know, want that to continue, want those departments to continue. Perhaps a different idea, and you know, my academic colleagues will, will know more about that, but can speak more to that about uh, interdisciplinarity or, you know, should there be a different way to approach sort of the disciplines, you know, of, of the humanities exchange with one another. Um, but then I don't even know that it's a new model. I just think that when I think about the public humanities, it's in the exchange of stories and ideas um, and experiences. So I am, as I was, you know, as changed by hearing Sandro Cisneros, as I understand that she and other practitioners of the humanities are by being in, being in public spaces. So I think what's shifted for me a lot is not, I don't talk about access in the same way because that implies that we've got the goods, we're gonna open the gate and deliver. And that's not, for me, how the humanities happen. They happen, when I am talking to the blues historian and the mayor of Rolling Fork, and they are proud of these signs, uh, and this is a priority for them is to have their history 
back in the ground in a town that's now of, I don't know how many hundreds of people decimated. So for me, it's, I think it's always been happening, <laughs> is more my point, that exchange of ideas. Maybe it's where it happens, who funds it, and I think also the idea of um, not coming into community to say you need this good, you know, humanities vitamin or something, right? This is more um, what are you looking for, community? Um, and then it's so it's planning and development of these programs, or there's probably a new word for it, um, experiences that are with and in communities. So coming from community centers, and those can be in and around campus for sure. Um, I, I sort of, when people say to me, I get, I talk about this a lot, but when I say, tell people what I do, they give me the head tilt, oh. <laughs> you know, oh, you do the humanities. Some people are like, oh, that's so tough, the lack of funding. Nope, actually last year, 20% increase from Congress. I mean, sure, there, is, there are a lot of cultural battlefields right now, but you know, how is Sappho doing? Fabulous. How is Frederick doing? Great. You know, I mean, these are, there is, you know, in community where I am, the humanities are thriving, which is not to say that there aren't crises and there aren't um, lots of threats, but the humanities themselves, I think, are, are thriving. Thank you. Um, yes, Sean? So this, this is fantastic, and I want to, um, I want to try to point to a through line, and, and hopefully it's a question to maybe be answered over the next day or so. Um, but yesterday, Ed Linenthal, um, who will be speaking later today, gave a seminar and talked about some of the tensions and dynamics between um, survivors of different events, and those who abstract around it, right? What, what Shad Mishad was just talking about, that, that, that moment. Um, maybe it's sort of the raw and the cooked in some way, and maybe our lesson is that things aren't so cooked as we want them to be. I'm, I'm wondering if, um, as, a, as a sort of a through line, we're hearing now about the relation, the, the advocacy for the humanities within the public sphere, which is tremendously important, and I'm heartened to hear the, how well things are going. Um, and what part of, I think, what you know, makes Walter's story so powerful, and um, Jim alluded to it, I think, in Ralph's voice, um, was the going into government, um, which, of course, Lois and Laura have done. And I'm wondering how we look at that story from all sides the extent to which that voice of bringing people together, of putting perspectives in conversation with one another, can be accomplished in multiple spheres, in the academic sphere, in the sphere of the public humanities, which I think is about platform building, but then the question arises when we're actually doing it in a sector, like government, and we're building a program, how do we do that so that the abstract doesn't drive everything to the exclusion of the people for whom the program, their lives are at stake or their futures are at stake. So I'm not posing this in the sense of that we can answer this right now, but in the sense that I hope this can be a, like I, there's a theme emerging here from yesterday to this morning that it would be fun to explore as we, as we continue. All right. Um, Laura, did yeah, you have sure. Actually, un unsurprisingly, I have a very similar question as, Sh as Sean, and so I'll just build on it because, well, first of all, thanks to everyone here, and I look forward to so much more. It means incredibly amount. Um, but I, listening to David Marshall kick this off with history and our forefathers, they were men, uh, um, and their, their allegiance, their affinity to the humanities, to the spirit, to these words, I was lifted up thinking, and you know, President Johnson, was so lifted up thinking, wow, you know, that that was so intentional that our democracy is 
connected to these ideals and to the to this to the work that you all are have dedicated your careers to towards and my dad certainly did and and then just to kind of juxtapose that with the reality of our <laughs> politics now I, i'm so happy to hear that the funding has in, is increased because i just wonder sort of yeah, so, okay. Yeah. I just yeah. wonder sort of like what the mood is within the humanities, public humanities field now, and do you wrestle with how you do cross into the sector of elected people like myself, where there seems to be no connection to spirit or to intellect? I mean, not to be too depressing about it, but there isn't sort of that, if anything, it's a sort of a pressure to not be that way, right? To not talk down and to not, um, I don't know, I just was curious if, if that's like a, if that's even part of, are you just kind of understandably going your own way and cultivating it elsewhere or is no. there still an intention to try to engage? There has to be an intention to engage if you're looking at this Congress, sure. right? So it will be not surprising, I mean, not all the time, right? I mean, if some offices don't want to meet yeah. and they just flat out don't believe in public funding or they don't believe in support. And often, in your reference to the forefathers and the history, that's very meaningful to, to many elected officials, but they just don't want public funding for it, right? Sure. So there are other ways that we can talk, talk about that. Um, but no, we cannot, and I'm reminded of this from our humanities councils in Mississippi, in North Dakota, some very interesting recent conversations in Kansas, in places where they have removed the words liberal arts from right. their buildings, from their curricula, and they'd like to remove the word humanities from buildings, from departments, from, and, and maybe not even the humanities themselves, but the language, right? So it will not be a surprise to you to hear that it's through personal relationships. So it's one at a time, yeah. and it is our, our council executive directors and other colleagues at National Humanities Alliance inviting electeds, please come see our exhibit on um, democracy. Please come see our exhibit on um, creativity and imagination. I'll give you a personal tour and I'll show you what these federal dollars are doing. We don't just have our hand out. We raise local money. We raise, you know, it's a partnership. It's a, a private-public partnership. Um, so that, I think that is really the only way. And in my, this morning, I got a number of emails from elected officials, uh, Republicans, uh, about the House vote last week on the floor about eliminating NEH that said, nope, I'm, I'm not going to vote for that because I believe in your old history project. I believe in the monies that are coming. Now, you know, that's not everybody, and this is a very diff con different Congress than others, but um, we, are, we are for all, and yes, it's through that local story that we, that we connect. Well, we do not go our own way. And I that's would reassuring. add to that, that um, I'm okay with this, that we've gotten a lot more sophisticated in the humanities community about making those political connections. Um, so Phoebe's on the board of the National Humanities Alliance and the Federation and the NHA have worked really closely together in the last 10 years in particular. And there's been support from the Mellon Foundation. So there's really an effort to look at those local projects, particularly the ones in the districts of you know, uh, members of Congress who might not be assumed to automatically support um, uh, the, the National Endowment for the Humanities or other projects and to show them how vibrant these projects are for their community. And in fact, you know, that language that George Washington used saying this is crucial to the prosperity of the nation is actually true. I mean, there really is an economic impact from a lot of these. And, you know, it's interesting that Senator Murkowski has been a very big supporter of the NEH and has saved the NEH in some of those appropriations. You know, I think it's the Interior Committee, actually. I don't remember what it's called now that has the NEH. And, it's, and Greg knows this because of his work with Native American and Indigenous Studies. Uh, because the NEH does a great job of supporting language preservation in the Native American languages. And Lisa Murkowski has a constituent
constituency, she understands it in Alaska, that's really important for her voters and for her people there. So finding those connections, what speaks to them. So, you know, for some people, you can just make the general elevated argument, but really we've got to be sophisticated in thinking about you know, what's meaningful in that district in the same way that somebody would be talking about you know, building a plant there or something. Right, and I'll also say the, the great work of National Humanities Alliance, and we're doing a little bit of, we're doing more of this, is uh, that data and evaluation work. So doing some of that hard, well I don't know if it's hard science, but doing the hard science research on what are the impacts. Economic, yes, and the arts has done that beautifully, but for the humanities, what are, what are the impacts? Uh, studies coming out of the um, American Academy for Arts and Sciences, the Humanities Indicators Projects about jobs uh, for students who have humanities majors. So we're getting to, you know, we're getting to that research and to that science. Interestingly, I mean, it's coming out from many different sectors now. Um, so I think also referring to some of that, that data is really important to folks. And I understand that for too long, we sort of said this is just inherently good, right? Right. Well, let's thank, thank you. For, that's reassuring. I mean, just the, the piece originally when the CAP Center was started that I was most excited about was the internship program. Just to simply, like, to be as small and myopic as getting a handful of students every year who study <laughs> ethics, study religious studies into public sector offices, you know. So I know that continues and it's something, I'm, something yeah. I'm super proud of. Yeah, no, that's a crucial thing. I think we're just about out of time, so maybe one last question or a comment. Okay. Um, sorry, if you can't hear me, I have a little bit of a cold. I'm wondering if it's a little more simple than what we're talking about. Um, we're always very siloed, and we're very siloed in universities. Now, I was an engineer, an engineer major. I'm a venture capitalist now on the impact side, but I took this class and I took the moral majority class he had. She's in Hollywood. She's in the food systems. Could we holistically think about education instead of just having a humanities department that in a state like ours where we can do things differently than Mississippi, have the governor say it's a requirement to take humanity, one humanities class when you're an engineer when you're in Hollywood, and when you're in food systems. I mean, I worked on the space shuttle program, so I like to say it's not rocket science what we're trying to do, right? Because I know it. Um, and I think we, we make things way too complicated and siloed in our world. And I think at a university, and that's how you spread to communities, is through the students. I didn't know what humanities was. I didn't, I'm still not sure I know what humanities is. But I think there's a different way of doing it than going to the government, I mean, you know, it's hard right now. So I'm wondering if you have time to even answer that, if we could do, think about doing something like that. There are models. Right, there are models for uh, medical schools have mandatory humanities classes. Yeah. Do, do you want to comment? I mean, yeah, I mean, the universities, most universities do have general education requirements. But I think that part of the challenge for us is that the rubrics we have, the names, are not meaningful for students. They don't seem relevant, but the content of the courses truly is, they just don't know it. So humanities, word means nothing. Liberal arts, it, it, it sounds bad. Um, and, you know, but, and you know, part of our challenge is that a high school student thinks that the same courses in you know, high school are what happens here. So that English in high school is what English on campus is now. Our English department at UC Santa Barbara is a pioneer in the digital humanities with massive support from the, the National Endowment for the uh, Humanities. It's the first department in the country to have an environmental humanities uh, position. And we've hired several people in that. There's a literature and mind concentration which gets into kind of cognitive science. So I'm looking for ways, I've been doing this for years, they, it's partly marketing, but it's partly like what we call the courses. And because people don't understand, students don't understand that those courses in religious studies are going to change their lives and be really important because they just say, oh, religious studies, I'm not interested in religion. So that's part of what we're trying to do is to think about you know, these rubrics, but also how to kind of rethink the academic landscape. And in fact, if you talk to business leaders or people like you,
you know, people in industry, they say they care less about the major of the student. What they care about is critical thinking skills, communication skills, uh, creativity, the ability to work in diverse groups, the ability to collaborate. And they can train you, you know, in certain things. Uh, but that's really what they're looking for. But it's really hard to get that message through. Maybe you get Hollywood to tell the story better. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and we work a lot with the, with the entertainment industry on that, too. So anyway, I think we're out of time. So I'll Let's thank our panelists. What a great <laughs> Okay, so um, as close as you're going to get to a free lunch happens right now. We're, the, the Department of Religious Studies is uh, pleased to sponsor lunch for everyone. Uh, there are box lunches over here in the side room. Uh, you're welcome to eat in here or take them outside, whatnot, but you're on the hook to be back at 1 o'clock for the next great panel on uh, religious studies scholarship and the career and legacy of Walter Capps. So thank you, everybody, and uh, have a good lunch. Okay. Yeah, one o'clock. Yeah. Who was that? The last person, uh, David Marshall. He's the vice chancellor.
Oh, yeah. No worries. Hey, do you know how to work a Mac ma machine? I'm a PC user. Do you know anything about Macs? I'm also a PC user. Okay. What's your question, though? Maybe we can figure it out.
newcomer, but it's it, yeah, why? Yeah, it's like, I, I, I took your father's yeah. class. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, anyway, thanks for Yeah, you. really.
happened to Freebird.
Here they are. Thank you, guys.
Yes. Anywhere there's it because it's a university holiday, so any open room that we go to. I can tell who the A students are because they're already paying attention. I don't know what the rest of you. Uh, Okay. Well, s we've learned so much already, and this is, it's just um, so exciting for me to see this unfold and for you all to be here uh, to partake with us. Uh, a thank you to the Department of Religious Studies uh, and Chair Juan Campo for sponsoring lunch. So thank you for that. We all ate well. We're going to turn now to a panel this afternoon that features a number of students uh, trained by Walter Capps and explore the different ways they've embraced and extended his legacy. So I'm very much looking forward to this for selfish reasons. They're all colleagues I've learned so much from over the years and it's, it's just bound to be great. Introducing them and moderating the panel will be uh, Juan Campo, the chair of the Department of Religious Studies, and we're grateful that he's our chair. He's leading us forward in a, in a good time. We have exciting things to look forward to. So thank you for taking up this role uh, today, uh, Professor Campo. So thank you, welcome. Well, I'm, I'm truly humbled to be here today first in terms of the celebration of Walter Capp's life, who was so much a part of my career here at UCSB, and also to be here in the presence of his family, uh, Lois and Laura, friends from the community. Uh, Todd, <laughs> sorry, Todd. Uh, I know the ladies of the family more than you guys. So, <laughs> And also, of course, uh, seeing our, our fantastic student alumni, uh, our colleagues from religious studies and members of the community, uh, it's so, uh, such an honor to be here you know, before you and to be here on this occasion to celebrate Walter's life and career. Um, as a welcome, uh, I would like to uh, say that um, we need to acknowledge that UCSB is located on indigenous land. Uh, in recognizing the traditional customs of the land, we pay respect for the Chumash people, the history and culture of the community, and all Native Americans as America's first peoples. We pay respect to the Chumash elders past, present, and future, for they hold the memories, the traditions, and the culture of this area, which has come, become a place of learning for people from all over the world. Next, uh, next year, our department celebrates its uh, 60th year. It's gonna be our 60th anniversary. And uh, I've been here 40 of those years. <laughs> uh, some, uh, there are a few of us that have been here longer than that, so, um, but it, uh, it's really, we want to mark that occasion, but I think this is a good way to sort of get us oriented to the 60th anniversary. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about our origin myth. I think religious studies, we oftentimes uh, orient ourselves to how things began and, our, and how uh, different cultures and different religious traditions you know, think about their origins. Our origins, interestingly, as religious studies, unlike much of the country, we don't come out of theology or theology school or something like that. We kind of come out of political science uh, the first person to talk about teaching uh, anything religious at the University of California at Santa Barbara was in the political science department. Uh, and that was D. Mackenzie Brown back in the 1950s. So he is successful in getting a course in political science called Religious Institutions. I guess that was safe enough in those days. <laughs> you know, at a, at a modern uh, state university, getting all these baby boomers in and things. and. Uh, and so, uh, so it came about in 1958 was a, a, this course. 1963, you had the uh, Abington School District versus Shemp decision in the, in the Supreme Court, which allowed the teaching about religion in public schools. And I think that definitely you know, was made an impression in terms of making religious studies an important part of a, of a, a curriculum in a public university like the University of California. 
1964 is the, the date for the actual establishment of our department. And it had two young professors to sort of get it going. I can't imagine a department starting today with only two people. Uh, uh, our executive vice chancellor, David Marshall, is here. Maybe you can tell me there are some departments that try to do that. But, uh, but you know, this, I think it was uh, great that we were able to start a department with two, with, with Walter Capps as one of them, and, and W. Richard Comstock, Dick Comstock, as the others. Um, so that was two faculty in 1964. By 1983, when I first joined, we had 10. So multiplied fivefold, right, in that time period. So that, that's a sign of success. Uh, in addition to the, you know, the students that were taking our courses and the graduates that we produced during that time period. Uh, now we have, uh, by my count, uh, 21 tenured professors, six lecturers, and at least two professorships on the way. Fingers crossed. <laughs> so, uh, so we continue to grow. And we greatly appreciate the support um, our university has given us in making this possible as well as the community and our students. You know, we wouldn't be able to have growth in our department in these days when the bus is so, so tight without having a track record that we can build on and demonstrate, and demonstrate our importance and relevance to higher education in a public university system. True to the vision of its founding members, our department encompasses multiple methods, recognizes religious phenomena on a scale from local to the global, and engages with an inclusive array of peoples and cultures, past and present. We should recognize that UCSB's Department of Religious Studies was founded not only in a time of growth for public universities in the country, but also at a time of tremendous social change and turbulence, the 1960s, with the onset of the Vietnam War, the anti-war movements, the burning of the Bank of America and Isla Vista, assassinations of JFK, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and uh, Robert Kennedy, the urban riots that spread through the countries from Harlem, Rochester, Philadelphia, Watts, Chicago. It was also a time for the civil rights movements and the women's movement, all in the 1960s, a tremendous time of change and turbulence in American society, as well as conflict. So it's in this context that Walter recognized that religion was a field of studies that belongs in the university, encompassing both the humanities and social sciences. This outlook is epitomized in his 1972 book, The Ways of Understanding Religion. I have a dog-eared copy of that, much annotated, uh, that I got my first year of graduate school at the University of Chicago. We asked Jonathan Z. Smith, my, our, our sort of our mentor there when we started out, uh, what he'd recommend for us to read uh, in terms of, you know, a selection of different writings about uh, study and uh, methods and, and theories in religion. And that's the book he recommended by Walter Capps, a former colleague of Jonathan Z's back in the 19, late 1960s. You know, Jonathan Z. Smith was actually here at that time. And I think that relationship remained close through the years, even though they, though they had very divergent uh, personalities <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, and specializations. Um, so uh, there's this, in, and this, this book, The Ways of Understanding Religion, is kind of a predecessor over a decade, or more than a decade, of, his, uh, of another major uh, book, which is his uh, Religious Studies, The Making of a Discipline. Uh, in this book, he refers to religious studies as a field, uh, and then in, in, in the second book, he tries to really define what religious studies is as a, as a discipline based after a number of years of thinking about it and seeing how religious studies was growing in the country. But we, in addition to this theoretical, methodological, you know, uh, uh, strand of Walter's career, uh, we must also recognize that his vision extended beyond religion as a subject for rational inquiry and explanation to encompass religion as a meaningful ethical agent that shaped people's lives and enhanced the common good and civic values. So this involved a public-facing orientation, not an ivory tower, ivory tower uh, orientation to scholarship, but a public-facing orientation for scholarship and religious studies. And that's something that he increasingly embodied in the latter stages of his career. Uh, as a teacher, through courses like the impact of the Vietnam War, which we'll have more about in another session, and his course on the um, uh, uh, voices of the Stranger, I think. Again, these are first public-facing topics and, and things that you know, really try to make a, a contribution to the common, common good. 
So he, uh, in a public sphere, he's also, as we learned from this morning, the, the public advocate of the humanities. And, um, you know, the public-facing component of his career then leads to his uh, contributions uh, and leadership as a congressional candidate and as an actual member uh, of the House of Representatives, and I think very valued and, 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 and cherished by the, the, his, his uh, fellow representatives, even after a very short period of time in the House, he made a tremendous impression. So this public-facing aspect of, of Walter's life uh, lives on very much in the CAP Center today in an, area, in an era that is just as turbulent, if not more so, than the 1960s, making the vision that Walter had even more important for our, us to try to realize through the CAP Center and hopefully through the uh, activities of, of not only members of the CAP Center but also members of the Religious Studies faculty at UCSB. We want to have more of a public-facing component for that and revitalize that aspect of our, of our, of our community and our religious studies culture. So Walter's optimistic vision coming out of the 1960s is needed now more than ever. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first two presenters. I think we'll get a good, view, a good overview and much more in depth on the subject of Walter's contribution to the study of religion with our presenters this afternoon. And we begin with um, Edward Linenthal and Wendy Wright. And let me tell you a little bit about each of these this, uh, presenters. Edward? Uh, Ed. Edward is kind of awkward. <laughs> Sorry, Ed. <laughs> um, there he is. Uh, is a professor emeritus of history at Indiana University. He served as editor for the Journal of American History from 2005 to 2016. Uh, he served as a visiting scholar for the National Park Service and for almost a decade was a member of the Flight 93 Memorial Commission. That's after the 9-11 uh, attacks and the way those events are memorialized. For several years, he co-directed the Gilder Lehman's Institute of America's History Summer Teacher Seminar, 9-11 uh, American Memory at the National September 11th Memorial and Museum in New York, and he's the author and editor of seven books, and they're amazing books, but they're books that address you know, vital issues in terms of how memorial sites of, of, of tragedy and violence are memorialized and remembered, and uh, going from uh, you know, the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, bombing uh, to Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., and actual visits to Holocaust sites in, um, in Europe, and then also looking at the, uh, the bombing of the, the Oklahoma City bombing and also the 9-11 um, uh, attacks, and a number of other contexts, uh, Civil War battlefields, I mean, it could go on and on, but it's amazing, his scholarship, and the ways in which that contributes, I think, to greater public understanding uh, of, of the issues involved with these, uh, these sites. So uh, in addition to Ed, then, this, this, uh, this section of our, of our panel, we have Wendy Wright, uh, Professor Emerita of, uh, of Theology at Creighton University and presently an affiliate faculty of the Oblate School of Theology's Institute for the Study of Contemporary Spirituality. Uh, she earned her PhD in Religious Studies at UCSB in 1983, so as I came in, she was leaving. Uh, and her areas of expertise include the history of Christian spiritualities and the Catholic devotional traditions. She is the author of 17 books and over 60 academic articles and a longtime spiritual director working presently with the novitiate team of the Franciscans in, the central, in California's Central Coast. So, um, so we'll have their two pre presentations uh, and then we'll take a short break after that. The other three panelists, I'll introduce them and then for Q&A, uh, we'll do that at the very end. So please keep your questions and answers if you have any for the first two panelists uh, in mind. You might want to jot a note. There's some note paper over here, I noticed. So, uh, so Ed, do you want to start? Sure. Please come up. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> uh, before I turn to the subject at hand, I have a, a program note at the end of the sessions tomorrow. Uh, Todd Capps and I have adopted some of Walter's jokes to uh, modern dance, and <laughs> we, I mean, there are levels of creativity that the two of us have that haven't, haven't been plumbed, right, at, at all. And um, we, we, we're thoughtful, and so, so we know that you're going to want to sort of relive the presentation, so <clears throat> we'll have uh, CDs for sale there. <laughs> I, 
I don't want to be too forward, um, but it's really, these are really stocking stuffers for the whole family. So. <laughs> Yeah, and if you're wondering why IU ever let me loose in the classroom, this is a question that's been asked for <laughs> years now. Okay, uh, so Ula and I left Santa Barbara in 1979 to move back to Wisconsin, and I was fortunate Walter invited me back um, a number of times to do a presentation in the Vietnam class and for his to Tocqueville uh, uh, seminar to talk about struggles to memorialize um, violent events. And after one visit, after his unsuccessful bid in 1994, we were in his study at, at the Hermitage and he told me that he was at work on a book about religion and politics seen through the prism of running for office. And after successful campaign in 96, I recall thinking, this book could be delayed for a while. So uh, when I received an invitation to participate in a kind of first take of the stuff that we're doing this weekend, uh, Richard Hecht and I think Clark Roof organized this conference exploring the legacy of Walter Capp's contribution to religious studies in 2008. And a number of us who are speaking today were, um, were, were participating in that panel. I was, I was really excited and I wanted the opportunity to go through some of Walter's stuff, materials, uh, to, to know about his thinking about uh, why he ran for office and, and what he e expected. Uh, because it seemed to me that there was a quite different set of challenges that Walter um, would face. I mean, would his voice be distinct among the cacophony of voices uh, in Washington? Would he be perceived as little more than an exotic oddity, the professor who became congressman? Would he be framed and contained from the beginning? How did his vocation as scholar and teacher prepare him, if it did, for this challenge? So I called Congresswoman Lois Capps, Lois, and asked her if there was stuff. And she said, yes, indeed, there is stuff and it's all here and it's uncatalogued and you're more than welcome to come some days before the seminar uh, and go through what you can. So I spent I don't know, three or four days, Lois, sort of feverishly going through stuff at, to try and put together a, a, a presentation for the 2008 uh, program. And uh, I titled it Professor Capps goes to Congress, um, yes. Um, and I want to revisit that uh, today because I'm sure most all of you have not been browsing through the stuff which I'm now very glad to know is, is in the library at Santa Barbara. So there, there is, as you can imagine, a treasure trove of materials, proposals for books, God in the Oval Office, political religion in the Reagan era, and then he retitled that, I'm not sure when, Chief Pastor, Religion and the American Presidency, that extends the focus uh, beyond uh, Reagan. There are numerous videotapes, and I know we're going to see some of this from campaigns. There are drawers filled, sorry, with correspondence with many, many, many people. There are drafts of op-eds for the LA Times. There are autopsies of the 1994 campaign. I found Walter's justification, which I had always wondered about, for the seminars on de Tocqueville, and this is what he wrote uh, for the National Endowment of Humanities. The text is Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, and the subject is the status and function of religion within the democratic society. Reflecting on a 1986 seminar, Walter wrote that participants, his voice, recreated and extended an ongoing conversation, very much like the inquiry that is reflected in de Tocqueville's book. It was a conversation about what it means to be an American, what democracy asks of religion and religion of democracy, how the freedoms Americans enjoy are both sustained and thwarted and the place and protections of individual initiative within a democratic collective 
order. There is a Walter Capps manifesto uh, written for staff members as the campaign was being organized in fall of 1995. The categories are really interesting, and there were some documents, of course, in, in each of these. Uh, the larger global setting was one. National and domestic issues. The moral and spiritual temper of our times. Restoring a bond of political trust. The environment and individual and collective well-being. Affirmative action, gender issues, and the status of so-called other people. The primacy of education. Attitudes toward representative government. And Walter Capp's personal ambition. It's a fascinating document. Throughout, we hear clear, concise statements of conviction. Walter Capps urges mindfulness of the larger global framework and cautions that the United States is currently experiencing a dangerous isolationist uh, tendency. It's reflected in intense criticism of the United Nations. Walter Capps believes that the United States must exercise its global responsibilities in a cooperative, mutually supportive manner. Walter Capps attests that life does not flow from ideology and that American imperialism is not the answer to the world's needs. And in a short essay written in 1984, The Vietnam War and Cultural Memory, Walter informed readers, I became interested in studying the impact of the Vietnam War in 1977. And we've heard about some of the dramatic moments earlier today. He writes, when I was given some responsibility for programming within the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, uh, programs about Vietnam uh, and the impact of the Vietnam War about liberal ideology. He was moved, as we've heard, about the power of veteran stories. I remember participating in a 1978 center conference, the Vietnam War and American Values, <clears throat> at which Walter offered a paper for discussion, the war's transformation and you can find this in the Center Magazine, uh, July and August 1978. And it seemed to me that from this moment on, Walter's attention turned not only to the complex legacies of the Vietnam War, but what he, of course, and many others saw as enduring deformations in American public culture. Well before the, uh, the, the boom in memory studies in memory, uh, many fields came Walter's book, the Unfinished War. In both the Vietnam and Voices of the Stranger courses, Walter was willing to live with and ask his students to live with the intellectually and emotionally draining realization that there are certain chronic afflictions that do not allow closure or redemptive endings. Yet he was steadfast in his belief that, in his words, Veterans who are leading the way are pointing to some deeply abiding human truths that are encountered in regions lying far beyond worlds made accessible by a, by a political dialectics. He understood the power of the witness at that point, an emerging sacred figure in the culture who returned from extreme situations or conditions to offer testimony, contemporary sacred narratives. I thought often of Walter's characterization of the war <clears throat> as unfinished, particularly as I was immersed in my work in Oklahoma City uh, about the impact of a terrorist attack upon an American city and the predicament of aftermath that occurs in events like these. Uh, I thought about his book as I chose the title of my book in Oklahoma City, The Unfinished Bombing. Oklahoma City in American memory. <clears throat> Too often, strategies are deployed that transform those impacted by violence into patients rather than witnesses and insist that their stories be framed as illness narratives rather than impassioned testimony, the crucial language of moral witness. Walter modeled for me and others uh, 
how our professional journeys could take us beyond the academy. And he was not alone in the religious studies department. One of the first challenges I recall was offered by Richard Hecht, who I wish could be here, in a 1979 essay called Religious Studies After the Holocaust. And Richard wrote, no, uh, no academic discipline within the modern university can shield itself from the impact of history and historical events. Attempts to clearly separate what is done within the university context and what occurs in history are short-lived. All disciplines within the university are conditioned by history. This simple fact, he writes, is even more powerful within those disciplines which self-consciously define themselves as having something to say to the historical understanding of man and to the human predicament at the end of the 20th century. Richard concludes, we have not yet realized that historical events of our century have doomed our enterprise to antiquarian studies or have made what we are doing even more vital. Walter followed in 1981 with a challenging essay titled Contemporary Sociopolitical Change and the Work of Religious Studies. Why, he asks, have we not developed a mode of critical cultural consciousness which utilizes religion as its primary means of access. And when we have learned to do this, why do we restrict our focus of inquiry to the world of the past tense? Why are we not able to say more about the dynamics of contemporary cultural change? In that same piece, Walter branded into my mind what felt like a declaration of intellectual independence for the kind of work that I wanted to do. He writes, my feeling is, and I'm being self-critical, that we are still writing term papers to each other rather than thinking through the strategy by which religious studies might more regularly and substantially contribute to the welfare of our larger collective life. And is it any wonder that many of us would have turned to these kinds of challenges um, in our work to, to want to make a difference uh, in, in the wider public. I never really cared about, frankly, writing books for my colleagues. I talked to them all the time. They were busy with their own work. When I wrote, uh, always, I had in mind a next door neighbor who was not an academic, but was a thinking person. I wanted to write a book for, for them, and I avoided at all costs uh, the kind of methodological heavy breathing that goes on in religious studies. <clears throat> I don't know if any of you remember <laughs> what Walter would say when someone asked him if, if he had a methodology. <laughs> I've gotten into a lot of trouble using Walter's term. He said, well, I had one, but it was shot off in the war. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah. Probably not the best time to take up a collection, is it? <laughs> so let me conclude with a focus on Walter's early thoughts about the book manuscript that uh, I mentioned. And I haven't done anything since this time at, um, at the Caps home, so um, maybe people have found more chapters. It would be wonderful if they did. And it felt to me like Walter was um, writing sort of these thoughts to himself, that it was like a pre-first draft uh, uh, thinking. The introduction was called On Running for Congress, and it's an extended commentary on the meaning and message of the 1994 election. Interesting. It does not stand, he writes, as the event which marks a decision by the citizenry to chart a new path. Rather, it symbolizes an explosion of collective emotion against prevailing government no longer trusted or respected, and at times hardly even recognized. Um, right, the vision of dark clouds, right, already there, now just on steroids. Chapter one, a candidate's perspective. Walter writes about his many activities that took him to Washington over many years, 
And he came to recognize, he reflects, much of our aspiration as a people cannot approximate full fruition unless it is validated by the legislative process. He first gave serious consideration to running after working with Senator Bob Kerry's campaign for president in 1992. Then came deep struggle. I was forewarned that running for office is an identity-defining experience. Perhaps nothing you have ever encountered, he was told, will define you as deeply and as surely. Walter visited the offices of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee and emerged quite discouraged. After all, he writes, what did I know about crime, the economy, immigration, and Governor Wilson? What I did know, and knew rather well, was how to create and teach college and university classes, stimulate intellectual interest in a topic, conduct research, and of course, think about beliefs and attitudes, individual aspirations, the spirit of our times, the desires of people all over the earth to live together in peace, the longings among the less fortunate for a life of realistic promise, and the desire of young people for an opportunity to live their ideals in a world that is given formation by hope rather than fear, and generosity rather than anger. A world that is given formation by hope rather than fear, and generosity rather than anger. Why then did he run? The reason has more to do he reflects, was seeing it as an expansion of vocation, believing that I had something to contribute rather than the fulfillment of a life's ambition. It is no small thing, he cautions, <clears throat> to seek elected office. To be a representative of the people is to seek entry into important protected places of their lives, to ask them to attach their dreams and aspirations, and yes, their indignations, to the candidate's instrumentational abilities. And a very brief Walter story. Um, we have to have at least one. We really should have many more, but time is necessary. So, uh, and Walter tells, it, tells us one on himself. He recalls the burden of the oft-asked question, how do we know you are not another Bill Clinton? And Walter said, we tried for a bit of humor some of the time. I'm not Bill Clinton. I play the tuba. <laughs> and then he writes, but the humorous response did not suffice. The last chapter I read, and I have no idea if Walter saw this as the final chapter, is titled Politics and Spirituality. The first section is entitled Politics as Pilgrimage. I am suggesting, he writes, that the run for political office is like pilgrimage in a number of ways. It is directed movement. It requires total involvement. The movement and involvement create a strong sense of community in that one is accompanied on the journey by persons who are dedicated to the same cause and or to sustain the pilgrim. And the bonding is as strong as anything the participants had previously experienced. This is why, he writes, campaign activists, when talking about their experiences, tend to highlight one campaign that was extraordinary for them. Wherever it happened, whatever the political season, this was the normative pilgrimage, the one in which values and stamina were tested, and the recollection of who actually got the most vote sometimes occurs as an afterthought. To realize that the race is over is to sense that life can begin to return to some sense of normalcy. It's why those who devised the liturgical year made provision for the exciting, uplifting, exhilarating, high holy days, to be followed by days when the human spirit could somehow take refuge in what is most appropriately called ordinary time. The degree of soul searching that belongs to politics, particularly in the heat of the campaign, <clears throat> is not unlike that which is fostered in religion. 
The difference is that religion provides a standard or some authorized vectors in relation to which the search is conducted, while the vectors that are most uh, promising in politics are the numbers that tell one how it appears that one is doing relative to how one's opponent is doing. Walters, and I gather this from conversations that this was fairly well known, his dislike for fundraising um, is evident in the next section, uh, politics as mendicant experience. <laughs> In traditional religious terms, he writes, a mendicant is a person who renounces the ownership of personal property and sometimes in very austere fashion relies on the goodwill and the charity of others. The politician, by comparison and contrast, asks for money from virtually everyone with whom he or she comes in contact. The support a monk seeks, however, is affirmation of the way he or she trusts the way the universe is ordered. That is, they live by grace, the support of others, and the bounty of whoever rules this earth in politics, the same transaction have become so completely tarnished that they become bane rather than blessing, impediment rather than facilitator. The final sectors, uh, sorry, the sections of this chapter are progressive politics and progressive spirituality, contrasting the world of politics and academics and the teaching of Jesus. It is a topic, Walter writes, whose force has been growing in my reflections and which I suspect is more central to the subject of this chapter than I can fully appreciate. It was on a trip to Jerusalem, he remembers, a life-affecting trip when a completely unexpected fusion took place. It was a fusion regarding the relationship between politics and the religious life, in a word. It was while we were there that I became aware of the political dimensions of the ministry of Jesus. It is about how Jesus of Nazareth lived his life and spent his time traveling from town to town to talk with assembled groups about what was happening in their lives in both individual and collective sense and to offer words of encouragement. There are similarities, he writes, between this form of ministry and running for office. How did anyone know Jesus would be coming? On what basis did he choose his topics? Did he give the same talk several times? Were his audiences mostly pliant, or did some give him a difficult time? How did he make his voice heard? Did he ever tire of the daily grind? How dependent was he upon his advisors? The only sin he always condemned, Walter notes, was that of self-righteousness. He was a man of compassion who recognized children, gave validation to people of other races and cultures, and when the choice had to be made, put human factors above prescribed cultic practice or established legal obligation. The ultimate vision, shared by other persons of great compassion, Walter writes, is that the world is unitary and that our politics and our spirituality cannot forever be bifurcated, but they are rather ingredients in the same whole. My own view, he writes, is that reciprocity needs to rule, namely that spiritual vitality enjoins political culture and political culture is complemented by recognition of the place and the power of the transcendent. So, my formal comments. Um, and before, I know I'm probably a little bit over time, but since we probably won't be doing this again, at least with the same audience, um, I want just to say a couple of, of personal uh, notes here. Um, whenever we were invited to the CAPS home, it was like, the highlight of the day, week, month. 
year. Um, when Walter and Lois went away, we stayed with the kids once, the kids, and um, went, of course, to McConnell's, and had a wonderful time. Walter and Lois uh, had a gorgeous male golden retriever named Chester, and we took care of, of Chester, or Chester took care of us, I'm not sure which, and we were blessed then for almost 40 years with golden retrievers. And the last one was a big, big male, just like Chester. Um, and his name was Chester Austin Linenthal. Mm -hmm. we, we thought about the Caps family all the time with, with our goldens. Um, the night that my mother died, um, very sadly, very early, in really quite a horrible situation, uh, Ula and I, went over to the Capses that night. And I don't think we talked a whole lot. Um, we were just sort of there. And those of you who've been there know that that's really enough, that the place massaged you with kindness and with understanding and with love. And it has always been and continues um, to be that way. Uh, so, final thing that I'll mention, um, not the final one I could mention, but, but 1980, you be told, 1982, whatever it was, um, uh, yeah, I got a call in Wisconsin, um, no, I'm sorry, not 1982, 2002, sorry, uh, asking if I would offer the CAPS lecture for the Humanities Council. Of course, my first word was, yes, absolutely, with a big exclamation mark at the end of that. Um, my second sentence was, is Lois going to be there? And she was in Minneapolis, sitting in the front row, so I tried to be on my best behavior, but <laughs> who knows. Um, but to, you know, to be a student of Walter's and then to sort of thank him uh, for what he did to me in all kinds of ways by doing a lecture um, in, in his name with Lois there was, um, everyone should have those kind of moments in their life. So thank you very much. Well, can you hear me okay? Yeah, thank you. It's a little overwhelming to, um, to speak after those beautiful uh, sentiments of Ed's and the extraordinary um, energy of the Humanities Council people uh, today. Um, Ed's wonderful seminar yesterday. Um, but here I am, and... <laughs> This is an okay thing. Um, when I was asked to um, participate in this and to think about Walter Capps and the study of religion, I decided not to talk about my ongoing work, but rather to talk about what it meant to learn alongside Walter. And this is pre-Vietnam class pre the expanded work with the humanities, pre his foray into politics. So this was, um, I studied with him from 1974, finally got my doctorate in 1983. But it was, my experience of Walt was, all of this was sort of in the background and budding, but my experience of him was quite different. And what I'd like to share with you is what it was like to learn alongside him, because he was not just a teacher, he was a, a fellow learner. And I learned a lot about myself and about what it means to encounter religious experience and also what it means to pass that on to other people. I've entitled this talk, um, the mystic mode, and I think that needs to be a little bit of an explanation for it. 
as I said, I studied with Walter from 1974, finally uh, graduating in 1983, but over the years we kept in frequent touch. In fact, just months before his death, when he was serving at the uh, United States House of Representatives, he and Lois traveled to Omaha, Nebraska to deliver an address entitled From Campus to Congress, The Journey of a Peacemaker at Creighton University where my husband and I were teaching at the time. And as I've suggested, many of you will speak much more elaborately and eloquently about the multiple facets of his scholarly work and how that continues today. But again, I, I want to focus what it was like to learn in his company. Not just what was learned, but how learning took place. During the decade of my studies, Walt's ever-inquiring mind had grown fascinated with the contemplative or mystical writings of the Western Christian tradition. Fortuitously, that mirrored my own budding fascination. As a result, he and I explored that field together. I TA'd for him. We developed a course called The Monastic Impulse. And eventually, we edited a book together entitled Silent Fire, An Invitation to Western Mysticism, which was published by Harper and Rowe in 78. This is almost like a, a museum relic at this point or something, an <laughs> artifact. The Mystic Mode was the title of the forewording essay that Rolt wrote for our volume. My contribution to the publication was the journeyman's labor of editing selections and writing introductory paragraphs for each of those represented Christian spiritual masters. But Walt's part was more conceptual. He probed what he came to describe as the mystic mode, which he said, and this is an important point here, did not denote something esoteric but rather a fundamental way of being human and of relating to the world. I'll underscore that again. A fundamental way of being human and of relating to the world. Walt's probing of this mob, especially during the 70s, I would contend helps to illuminate his fundamental approach to learning, which in turn illuminated and animated his teaching, his scholarship, his love of the humanities, and public service. Now, a caveat here. I'm not claiming Walt as some sort of ill-defined um, mystic or something, nor am I suggesting that his toe-dipping into the theoretical waters on the study of mysticism was complete or prescient. Huge amounts of literature have been developed since this time. But I do think that Walt's exploration gives access to his approach to learning. And this is the way he expanded about the mystic mode. Distinct from a host of other ways of being human, the mystic way does not approach the world as though it was a problem to be solved, nor does it view it as a puzzle to be pieced together or even an entity that can be penetrated by a formula or idea. The mystic way exposes reality as a mystery, deep but trustworthy, a very large portion of which will always remain unknown, uncharted, and resistant to human programming. So what does this say about learning and studying in religion? I have an indelible image etched on my memory of the first class I took from Professor Capps. He was lecturing on the fourth century classic, The Confessions of St. Augustine of Hippo, and he scrawled two terms in big, bold capital letters on the blackboard. Superbia and humilitas. Of all the approaches that can be taken to that classic text, you can do literary analysis, philosophical, historical, theological, on and on. The central vivid point our professor wanted to drive home was Augustine's interior transition, his shift 
from the, to the posture that would later define his life. Most of you know this, but Augustine had for most of his youth taken and used things for self-promoting ends. He'd striven energetically in platonic ascent to the heights of spiritual attainment, superbia, agency, pride. That was Augustine's mode. His conversion was to the attitude of humilitas, a receptive, awed, graced, grateful stance focused away from self-promotion to attention to something other than the self. This early introduction taught me not only about a great Christian classic, but suggested that the study of religion is at least in part about what it means to orient the self. Religion delves into such questions about what it means to be fully human and how one orients to reality. Over the years, I would come to feel that Walt's own way of being and learning was just such a posture. And people have said this in different ways during this talk about he'd come into a room and he would glow and people, you know, just his wonderful humor and all that sort of thing. But it was an, eerie, an interior orientation that was receptive, open to surprise, discovery, constantly probing, refusing to capture, eager always to deep, dig deeper into the dimensions of whatever can give rise to human flourishing. This, I think, was much more than just avid curiosity or an exercise in the teaching on the many-sidedness of truth. It was Walt's way. It's true that Walt's scholarly approach to the dis discipline of religion was serious. It was serious, but it was rarely solemn. His approach was also joyful, playful, sometimes mischievous. Tooling around the city in the little red VW bug, hosting grad parties in the living room of 1724 Santa Barbara Street, the address, easily recalled, he would say, as it was the same as Immanuel Kant's birth year. <laughs> presiding over those gatherings at the keyboard of the piano, banging out the chords from the hymns of the Lutheran hymnal, and that's really important. The Lutheran hymnal is really important when you understand Walt. And if we were lucky, the giant tuba might emerge from its storage to accompany our singing. This playfulness carried over into his academic work, the way into the core of religious apprehension was, he knew, multidimensional and interdisciplinary, just as the discipline of religious studies implies. The way is through analysis, yes, but also through exploration of the full range of human endeavor, the sweep of hymnody, the beauty of art and architecture, the dense wisdom of poetry, the texture and shape of the inner longing of the heart. All the artifacts of our human search for meaning. Walt gave voice to this as he was writing his Mystic Mode essay. He said, in the mystic way, reality is neither seized nor deciphered, nor can it be completely committed to an ideational formulation. Instead, it is engaged delicately, knowingly, and passionately, it is engaged by being loved. And being loved, it is also given an interior place. In this vein, Walt always stressed engagement. He certainly could employ any number of theoretical lenses to his study of human religiosity, but almost more than analytical tools, engagement was foremost. We've heard this already. He was all about field trips, immersions, direct experience. As his student, I perched with others on hard-backed chairs and spoke across an iron grill to the habited sisters in the cloister parlor of the Santa Barbara Poor Clares. And I sat at the feet of a young novice master at a Cistercian monastery in Oregon who unforgettably paraphrased poet Rainer Maria Rilke. To be a Christian 
is not about knowing the answers, but about living in the part of the self where the question is constantly being born. This emphasis on engagement, you know, has characterized as Walt's approach to all his career. His, his Vietnam course, he ferried students to Washington, D.C. He traveled with veterans to the Soviet Union and to Vietnam. He brought voices of experience, voices of otherness into his classes. And later, he took a pilgrimage into the political landscape. All of these were potentially places of presence, places where insight and transformation might occur. As a student, this sort of engagement was formative. It set one down in a new landscape beyond thought, theory, and analysis into the part of the self where, as Rilke posited, the question was being born. A striking aspect of Walt as a mentor was knowing that he too was engaged in that same ongoing dynamic personal journey. In his edited volume, Thomas Merton, Preview of the Asian Journey, which transcribed and commented on the Cistercian Monk's 19, uh, 1968 conversations at the Center for the Study of Democratic, Democratic Institutions here at UCSB, Caps wrote this. He, Merton, recognized the need to do more than study the texts talk to expert witnesses, and write descriptive and interpretive essays. It was necessary for him to travel, to undertake a pilgrimage to Asia so that he could make his own observations within the natural habitat of Asian religious traditions. He wanted to travel because pilgrimage represented the next stage of development in his own spiritual path. I think it's not inappropriate to suggest that this sentiment can be applied to Walt as well. Engagement meant travel, but the engagement meant as well arrival at places of presence and the possibility of risking one's own spiritual religious assumptions, dipping into uncharted waters where reality in all its daunting complexity potentially exposes itself to use Walt's words. Reality exposes itself as a mystery, deep but, untrustworthy, but trustworthy, a very large portion of which will always remain unknown, uncharted, and resistant to human probing. Learning for Walt involved awareness to what goes on within the self, yes, but equally it involved attentiveness to what was emerging on the cultural landscape. Steeped in the history and theology of the Christian past from his studies at Augustana Theological and at Yale, Walt sensed the future, alert, was alert to the religious themes dawning on the contemporary horizon. This was certainly true when I entered the grad program at UCSB. At that time, actually, little was very much available in the English-speaking world of the variety and depth of the Western Christian spiritual practices, texts, and figures. Interest was just dawning. My generation had looked to the East, to D.T. Suzuki's Zen, Herman Hesse's Siddhartha. But Walt and my professor-student foray into the Western wisdom sources appeared at the same time that it was also cresting culturally. It was at the same time that we published Sacred fire, that the very first volume of what now is over a hundred volume series of English translations and critical editions of Western spiritual classics appeared. So it was right on the crest of that. Likewise, his foray into mysticism predated by several decades the now definitive multi-volumed analysis of the Western mystical canyon uh, entitled The Presence of God authored by University of Chicago's Bernard McGinn. On the pastoral landscape, Walt's intuitions also mirrored the growing ecumenical awareness and appropriation spurred by the Roman Catholic Church's Second Vatican Council of the wealth of hidden Western spiritual treasures. 
Wealth's attentiveness, and again, we've heard this um, throughout the presentations that have just begun, to whatever was dawning on the landscape was keen and continued. He was fascinated by psychoanalytic theory as it could be applied to religious figures like Luther and Gandhi. Then there was his groundbreaking exploration of the religious impact of the Vietnam War, his foregrounding the voices of stranger, his early sense that something was going on with the religious right, which I have to say at the time was not seen as all significant by anybody uh, around him. They all went, oh, why are you bothering him with that? Um, his fascination with Václav Havel, the political visionary steeped in the humanities. His foray into public service was a part of this unfolding journey toward a deepening encounter with the sacred and its transformational presence. <laughs> Unitive and transformational, the mystic mode as Walt understood it, was not confined to a particular religious tradition nor to what is deemed formally instituted religion. Instead, he stressed that this mystic way was a fundamental way of being human and of relating to the world. And he has a wonderful paragraph in this um, essay that I think ex expresses the deep root of this awareness and I think it also expresses deeply what was felt in, in Walt's presence. Life, he said, is a supreme gift for which the most appropriate posture is the giving of thanks. The mystics have caught sight of the truth that something, indeed being, is when they take steps to monitor or influence the pulses of the interior life, it is because they have learned that the vitality that courses through their own spirits is of the same substance as that which issues from the heart of things. To acknowledge life as a supreme gift is to sense that the underlying mystery, unfathomable, ineffable, eventually unspeakable, is nevertheless benevolent. To receive it as mystery is to respect the beauty of its pathos. To learn alongside Walt Capps was to understand that grateful receptivity, passionate and playful engagement, Attentiveness both to the contours of the self and to the emerging longings of the world with all its beauty and pathos. This was what the study and learning of religion was all about. Thank you. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break and come back and reconvene with the three remaining speakers. Thank you. Yeah, and there are refreshments off to the left, and then at the end of the session, after we reconvene, there will be a reception that everyone's invited to here in this room.
Can I have your attention, please? Let's uh, get back to our seats for the second part of this afternoon's event. Can we take our seats, please? Great, great program. Hello. Are you within the sound of my voice? We have some great presenters. <laughs> Get them back. <laughs> it's getting quiet, so that's a good sign. All right, so let's, uh, let's get going with the second part of this afternoon's panel and presentations. Uh, we will have Q&A at the end of this uh, set of speakers. We have three speakers. Uh, the first is going to be Tomoko Masuzawa, who is Professor Emerita of the um, History and Comparative Literature at the University of Michigan. Uh, she's born and educated in Tokyo and holds an MA degree from Yale, a PhD, of course, from UCSB in Religious Studies. She's a scholar of European intellectual history with a special interest in modern discourses on religion and the history of the human sciences. She's the author of two books and many articles and has held a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship as well as a, a membership in the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. She lives in New York City. And just as an aside, I mean, uh, one of our most remarkable books is uh, uh, the one on invention of world religions or how European universalism was preserved in the um, language of pluralism. And, uh, and I was looking through the, the index of that, that book recently, and I noticed that the, a lot of the figures of religious studies uh, that she lists there, and that she you know, incorporates in her discourse in the book, were ones that Walter Capps had featured in this book, Ways of Understanding Religion, that I was introduced to in 1972. And then I look at the, I opened the book from the front, and then I see that actually this book is dedicated to the memory of Walter Katz, to reflect the, the connectivity you know, in your career and your writing and things. Our second speaker is um, Julie Ingersoll, and she's professor of religious studies at the University of Florida. She's the author of several articles and books on religion and politics, violence, and the religious right. As a former student of Walter Katz, Julie works to make scholarship available and accessible to the public. And she has written for such outlets as The Conversation, Religion Dispatches, and The Huffington Post. Her most recent book is Building God's Kingdom Inside the World of Christian Reconstruction. Our third speaker this afternoon is Sarah McFarland Taylor, and she's Associate Professor of Religious Studies and American Studies 
environmental policy and culture at Northwestern University. She's the author of Green Sisters, A Spiritual Ecology, and Ecopiety, Green Media, and the Dilemma of Environmental Virtue. After earning her doctorate from UCSB, Sarah went on to earn an additional advanced degree in media studies from the New School in New York City. So let's begin then with Tomoko. Thank you very much. Um, is this a good position for the mic? Yes? Okay, thank you. Um, of course, it's customary to start one's talk uh, by thanking the host for the occasion. But my following that venerable custom today is no mere routine observ uh, observation. Because what's being given to me now is not only the opportunity to speak, but also a chance to be among some of my oldest friends in the very place we shared some years of our youth, and a chance to gather together again, once, once again, to remember one great absence, that of Walters. So thank you, uh, Greg, uh, Greg and Dusty, and all others who are involved uh, in making this possible. Thank you very much. I titled this talk, Walter Capps and the Gift of Imagination, and I'm going to say something about what I owe to Walter, how he opened the horizon of scholarship for me, but I will be selective, quite selective, and focus on the one particular seminar that I took in my second year of graduate school, and the one that I recognize in retrospect that had a special significance for me. But then there are so many other ways in which uh, my having had Walter as a teacher and my coming into his orbit guided me, sustained me, and enabled me ultimately to have a rather interesting and generally happy academic life, or any kind of academic life for that matter. <laughs> Not easy, and I owe him a lot in all this. Um, uh, so, but these many other ways uh, are not very easily enumerated or described. So, I would just allude to these very, in, um, in sort of what you might call intangibles, by sharing a few images. Well, despite the graininess and it's being a bit out of focus and also the color being washed out over the years, because this is a regular print, right? Uh, I'm still very fond of this photograph uh, because it's a vintage Walter and Lois. Right? <laughs> to my mind, this captures so much of the warmth and cheerful assurance that the world of Wal Walter and the person of Walter emanated. And it is also an apt reminder that how much of that world is about Lois. I took this photograph, by the way. Um, this was a decades, literally decades, before there was such a thing as an iPhone, 1976 to be exact. Um, and uh, in those days, in order to take a photograph, you needed a special device called cameras. <laughs> Uh, and I happen to have one because I grew up in the country where you have been handed uh, a camera more or less as soon as you're done with this pacifier, <laughs> if your parents can afford it. And in any case, by this time I had one. And I think also Lois seemed to have one in her hands as well, right? And well, uh, uh, the... Uh, the, it's just people generally made the point of bringing camera to any occasion that they might want to monu uh, moment, uh, memorize and memorialize and to keep that moment for an as yet unknown moment in the future and to share. And here we are, the future has arrived. <laughs> in order to um, contextualize this image a bit, let me show you a few others from the same occasion, same day, same place. Is that Tucker's Grove? 
This is um, uh, Casa de Maria. Right, no, I never thought I would have an opportunity to embarrass Ed Linenthal uh, in public. <laughs> <laughs> but here he is, yes? Uh, between two women he adored, adores and admires, that is, lovely wife, Ula, and Lois. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, now you may notice that in those days, before the benighted um, ubiquity of selfies, um, people didn't always line up to pose. Right? <laughs> Even when they were aware uh, that the camera is pointed at them, uh, it was still possible to capture something spontaneous. Those smiles weren't staged. They were directed at you, or they were for someone else off to the side. When I show these pictures to some of my colleagues elsewhere, we outside of California particularly, um, they couldn't believe that they were taken at an academic conference. Just too much sunshine, too many people smiling. <laughs> you know? And what's that palm tree doing out there anyway? Right? All that sort of thing. So, but this was an academic conference uh, held at, uh, not on campus, it's true, um, but Casa de Maria, a Catholic retreat facility in Montecito. Many of you know that, of course. Um, here in this picture, I handed um, my camera to someone else so that I can be in the picture. Right? Uh, though I have no recollection whatsoever of the man who has his arm around me. <laughs> Um, I can tell you that standing next to Walter with white hair is late Jim Wiggins, a dear friend of Walter's and professor at Syracuse and a longtime executive director of, uh, yeah, I think that was an executive director of the American Academy of Religion, before Barbara Di Concini, by the way, yeah. Uh, next to Jim is, in fact, the guest of honor at the conference, and that is Jürgen Moltmann, standing on the right. Yeah, and uh, that would be Jürgen Moltmann, even though, of course, for most uh, people who are, this is, he's a German, um, reformed German theologian right, from Tübingen. Uh, and for those of you who know about him, perhaps more familiar image might be something like this, yeah? Or when his younger days, like that. Well, but bring him to California and into Walter's orbit, then he can lose his tie and the jacket and some of that Teutonic seriousness. <laughs> A kind of il penseroso kind of look, you know? And so, uh, here he is, genially conversing with Father Vincent, a sociologist on the faculty at the time, but the, uh, he was also a Benedictine monk, I was told. So, uh, as for me, on the other hand, um, this is my second year in graduate school, uh, and not being very familiar with matters theological, especially at that time, I can't recall the substance of the conference too well. But, I do remember very well how the event um, concluded. In the evening following the academic program, we all went dancing, <laughs> these two gentlemen included. Uh, and Walter, I think, was at least a co-conspirator, if not the chief in instigator of this uh, extracurricular activity. Anyway, we all filed into a bar in Montecito um, called um, Plow and Angel. And in fact, uh, much to my amazement, that institution still uh, exists, even though it doesn't look like, according to their website, nothing like what it was then. I mean, certainly it didn't look like any place that a bunch of graduate students would go dancing together with a few professors, a Calvinist theologian, and a marketing <laughs> type. But that's what happened, right? So, um, but now that we got to dancing, 
Uh, let me share one more photo and remember one more person. Standing next to Jim Wiggins in red shirt dress is Deborah Sills. Uh, as some of you no doubt recognize, yeah? And at the time of this photo, she was, like me, second year graduate student, but she was later to become uh, Walter's trusted administrative assistant when he was directing the uh, Center for the Democratic, uh, Study of Democratic Institutions. And Deb, well, she can get anyone to dance. <laughs> and we lost her much, much too early. Uh, the last time I was here in Santa Barbara, another former student from my own class, David Chilister, took me to the cemetery where Walter is buried. And not too far from uh, that grave is Deborah's. It, I'm not really an avid cemetery visitor, but um, that visit was very special. To be with a friend from many, many years ago, just to be close to the site of the absence of two people who had been dear to each of us. And I want to thank David for that afternoon, especially because he couldn't be here. So all of those people are, in a way, also populating this image. And uh, these photos that I've shown you are saturated with all memories and all manner of memories and sentiments. But they are not copyrighted, so if anyone would like to help them, I'd be happy to share. Just ask Dusty, I guess. Yeah. And now to the academic, promised academic part of this talk. This is a, the syllabus of the seminar I took with Walter in uh, winter 1977. The document runs page and a half, and uh, I'll be reading small parts of it. But again, I also made some, I asked uh, uh, Dusty to make some copies, so if you, anybody like this memento, you can have it. Um, now, you may be wondering whether I'm one of those people who would keep every syllabus and every scrap of paper on file forever. Well, I'm not. Uh, though I have kept quite a few for a good many years, but this one is about the only one that I still think about from time to time. And also, I kept all the books I uh, acquired for this course. And that was an amazing list, and I'll show you them. Religion and the P uh, Process of Visualization is the title of the course, offered through the College of Creative Studies. The subject is squarely religion, but religion considered from an unexpected angle. Religion not as an object to be sketched, defined, and classified like some sort of cultural specimen, but essentially as a um, problem idea, I like to call, as a discursive field, as something good to think with as um, uh, Levi Strauss might say. The first paragraph reads, the course is an experimental offering, no kidding, uh, proposed as an effective way of engaging in interdisciplinary work in the humanities. It is not a course that come ready-made, no, it didn't, but uh, one uh, whose formation depends upon the interest and contributions of all who participate in the process, instructor and student alike. Now, I'm sure you've heard something like similar or similar sounding in the decades since, uh, but this was no mere uh, concession or accommodation of student interests that are so, re uh, so uh, common these days. He really meant this, in other words. I think that he really did. In the, this proto-syllabus, I want to call it, we were given no itemized schedule of reading, as yet, anyway. Uh, no breakdown of assignments that might be helpful to, in a way, you know, calculate how to get a decent grade. 
right? None of that. Uh, what's uh, front and center is an idea. This was a risk, of course. Uh, in retrospect, uh, it seems to me that we were being gingerly challenged uh, whether we could really um, steady ourselves to, as we wade into a new, unfamiliar waters. You needed a certain degree of tolerance for thinking under the condition of possibilities, not certainty. Uh, that said, this proto-syllabus already suggests several en uh, entryways or portals into this realm of uncertainty. The most sweeping signpost um, appears in the second paragraph. The course defines, and I'm quoting again, the course de um, derives from a simple insight, namely that religion and visualization have something directly to do with each other. Accordingly, this course experiments with the prospect that religion has more to do with ways of seeing or ways of ascribing order or ways of discerning patterns and so on. So what did this mean? This paragraph that follows um, begins to loosen this knot of so-called insight. By the way, whenever you hear simple insight from him, that was <laughs> not to take it uh, 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 lightly. The course uh, will focus on at least two phenomena which belong to the process of visualization and have also been tapped to give meaning and definition to religion, namely illusion and uh, projection. Here, the point is to understand the visual dynamics of illusion and pro projection so as to penetrate the potential association with religion. So let me parse this a bit in my own words because this was my portal. When religion is deemed an illusion of projection, and these notions were often ascribed to certain left-leaning authors like Freud, Marx, and Weber, right? This is um, often taken to mean that these authors uh, discredited or dismissed religion as falsehood. Right? Uh, in many religion courses, this was reason enough to be done with these authors and move on. But in this seminar, we were invited to linger and to consider in earnest what is involved in the visualizing process. Call it projection, uh, perception, cognition, recognition, uh, projection, or illusion, for that matter. When a visual experience is deemed an illusion, are we saying that the uh, perceiver committed an error of judgment in what they saw? If seeing or visualizing is a projection, does this mean the perceiver is being a bit overzealous, perhaps overactive in structuring and constructing that experience so that they are in fact seeing more than what, what's really there, right? And you shouldn't be seeing all these extra things. Is that what we are saying? Or alternatively, could it be that the capacity to structure, construct, and synthesize is a uh, necessary constituent of the components of the perception as such. You hear Kant coming in, forms of percep uh, percep uh, perception and all that. Right? Uh, he's not disclosing. I don't think a, a name Kant didn't really uh, appear, uh, just in passing, you know, so, but um, it's obviously an illusion here. We considered this question in uh, the company of such authors as Rudolf Anheim, um, and it's Anheim here, uh, the psychologist and philosopher of art, and a, um, from a physiological point of view, in light of this fascinating book by British um, a neuropsychologist, I think you'll call them, uh, Richard Gregory. 
But the closest and dearest to Walter's heart is, I think, this book, uh, Art and the Illusion by E.H. Gombrich. The, at that time, he was the director of the Warburg Institute in London, and Walter often spoke fondly of the year he spent at the uh, Institute. Yeah. And by the way, when um, Gombrich came to speak at UCLA, um, Walter was nice enough to get the van and got a bunch of us to go hear him talk and introduce us to the speaker and so on. So he wasn't driving us always to the bar. <laughs> um, much as he was partial to art historians and scientists of vision, Walter's ambition is in fact, um, was rather somewhat greater and theoretically broader. I think that might be a way to put it. And this is evident, for instance, um, Let's see, okay, is that the right thing? Yeah, from this um, penultimate paragraph. This is the end of the, that document, and then the pen, penultimate do, uh, paragraph. The paragraph, this paragraph too, could use a bit of parsing. So let's say for now that this is uh, his intent on turn, his intent is to turn around or shifting the gear on what we, uh, disarmingly call often, an apparatus to uh, Western, uh, approach to, sorry, an approach to Western cultural history. That's his object and doesn't specify yet that much. He's proposing to depart from the prevailing mode of conceiving this history as so many layered uh, stories of organic, rise and fall of divergent styles. Right? And instead, to conceive of it uh, in terms of the vicissitude of, um, of the forms of intuition. So, so that's, again, you know, you can smell Kant right there. Um, our guides in this part of the journey was such books as uh, George Kubler's uh, Shape of Time. This one just, uh, 70th anniversary, just came out from Yale Press. I mean, classic, classic, right? And um, also the same kind of thing. Stephen Tolman and Jane Goodfield's The Discovery of Time. Space and time, forms of intuition, yeah. So all that was kind of coming out. And then, um, uh, let's see, and shifting the matter of paradigm, uh, uh, rather shifting to the matter of paradigms change. This was another book, a classic, uh, uh, Thomas Kuhn's A Structure of Scientific Revolution. And in the same spirit, of course, Karl Popper. Uh, so the, those are our, our reading list. <laughs> um, but at the same time, uh, we are not just, uh, we were not just, um, uh, nudge to a more philosophical, theoretical, and abstract. Rather, Walter showed us some exemplary cases, um, the example, like, exemplary cases that embody these possibilities, cultural, his, of cultural history, and how we might turn the direction of this fully phrased Western cultural history, and I think, uh, this John Sesnick survival of the pagan gods is as good an example as it could be. This was a wonderful book. I, I still go back to it. And so is Edgar Wind. So it seems befitting that the last book we read in the seminar was this slim volume, another work by Gombrich with the title uh, well, cultural, in, in search of cultural history with a big question mark silently imposed on it. Yeah. The summary of what the course was that, that I had just given you um, uh, is not something I could have given at the time when the seminar ended in 1977. 
uh, if someone were then ask me then, uh, you know, so how was the seminar? I would probably have said something like, "Well, very interesting, and I have no idea what happened." <laughs> uh, so, nearly half a century later, I think I know a bit better what happened. Still, was this the grand? plan already made it complete in Walter's mind at the time? Well, I'm not sure. And he didn't say it was, right? As you recall, he did urge us to take, out, uh, take our thinking in certain possible directions. And he told us that there, uh, these books will give us a good workout, and uh, therefore it would give us uh, good new muscles and strength to go forward. So, 40 plus years on, I think I understood what we, uh, we have learned, how we together, that is instructor and students alike, as he put it, how we contributed and co collaborated, not just for the duration of the semester, but for me over all these decades. Walter has been teacher for life. Thank you. Okay, Dusty promised me I was going to be able to handle this Mac without buttons. Right Thank you. Yeah. you <laughs> All right. Thank you. you can just use those to talk. Yep. Great. Hi, everyone. This is just such an exciting occasion. Um, I also want to thank the CAP Center and Greg and Dusty for all your work, and uh, I'm sure there were many other people involved in the work. Um, this is a terrific event, and I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I was struck by Ed's comments about the talk in Minneapolis and how it had this sense of sort of coming home with Lois in the audience. Uh, and this is something of that for me. So uh, anyway, thank you. Um, the following is a preface from Walter's book from 1990. Uh, one of the things that's fascinating to me about the talk so far is how it doesn't sound like we all studied with the same person, right? <laughs> We're all over the place. And, and we've had lists of books that Walter wrote, and the one that was important to me didn't show up on anybody else's <laughs> list yet. This, I, I, it's, that, it's just a fascinating fact. But anyway, um, so this is what he wrote in the preface to that. New right religion is a reluctant and unforgiving subject for a scholar in religious studies. By training and temperament, a scholar approaches subjects from this vantage point, that is religious studies, is quite prepared to consider all fundamentalisms as probable as exhibits of a sort of mental rigidity a more compelling human nature is obliged to overcome. New right religion is true believer religion, which, as everyone knows, is sometimes beguiled into dogmatic militancy and carries the ability, in some circumstances, to work pathological mischief on its devotees. I, this is still Walter. I did not undertake this project, I confess, as an advocate or out of deep personal empathy for the subject, it was simply that my curiosity, other people have spoken of that, my curiosity had been aroused by the fact that the rise of the new religious right seemed demonstrably out of touch with the real needs and deeper challenges of our time. Again, he wrote this in 1990. I wondered how this could be and how its proponents could respond to the course of human events in such peculiar fashion. Along the way, of course, I discovered that there was much more to the story than I had anticipated and that the movement's advocates were quite, in, quite able to explain their convictions on grounds they believed to be intellectually defensible. I also came to recognize just how easy it is to dismiss the religious right even before considering it or trying to comprehend it. I was caught in an unexpected place. I had not yet determined why religious right movements should have come to prominence, but I was developing confidence that there were such reasons. However, even to acknowledge this possibility 
is to, is to ascribe a degree of seriousness to the subject that is inconsistent with the disposition among scholars to dismiss the matter out of hand. Uh, I think Wendy referred to that, to that sense um, as Walter started getting interested in the religious right. This encapsulates so much about the interests that Walter and I shared, but more importantly, the way he approached his work that I have tried to emulate, the genuine curiosity and empathy even that he brought to everything, the real honest way he was interested in actually understanding people, even those with whom he would vehemently disagree. His desire to do work that was relevant to the issues of the day, and the biggest challenge for me, his enduring lack of cynicism. I want to focus on two themes. The first is the goal of understanding religion from the inside, including not only religions we're inclined to like, but also religions we may not, and how such inside understanding has helped my own work. And second, the importance of public scholarship. Uh, Tomoko, I just loved the images. Uh, it was so fun to watch your presentation. And I was really thrilled when I found this one with the tuba in it online, but I didn't have any of my own. I was lucky to be a grad student at UCSB to have multiple mentors who engaged me and supported me and challenged me, shaping my thinking. Clark Roof was my dissertation director, but Walter in ways that were both direct and indirect, had as much impact on my academic trajectory as anyone else. He was an important member of my committee and one of my examiners, but his influence predates my time here at UCSB. When I was a freshman, I needed a humanities course, and I heard religious studies was an easy A. <laughs> as it turned out, it wasn't easy. I took that course with Walter's first PhD student in his first year of teaching. Ed, we've gotten really old. <laughs> Ed and I stayed in touch for years, and when I wanted to return to school to do some graduate work in religious studies, I called him, and he set me up with a meeting with Walter. Before long, I was renting a room from Walter and Lois. And sometimes in the morning, I'd wake up to Walter playing the piano downstairs. But other times, Walter and I stayed up late at night watching in the TV room televangelist Benny Hinn slaying his, follow, his followers in the spirit in these massive stadiums. I don't know, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't even doing a PowerPoint and I said something to somebody about Benny Hinn and they, I got this blank look. So I don't know that you all know who this guy is. But he was one of the real, if you hear about the new apostolic reformation movement that is, is really in prominence at the moment, uh, he was one of the very earliest ones of these folks and he would do these massive stadium revivals. I've got a picture of the size of the stadium. But he had just ripped off his coat done this and the guy fell down in the spirit. We had a lot of fun watching this guy. All over the, all over the stage people were falling down but this, this is the favorite stuff. So that's his hand down here and what he would do is he would throw the Holy Spirit up into one quadrant of the stadium and everybody there would fall down and then he'd throw it over here and everybody else would fall down. Um, so it was a lot of fun to watch on TV. Um, <laughs> As Walter noted, there's something different about studying religion we don't like. I suppose with the religious right these days, this is even more clear as they've become such a threat to democracy. The part of American Christianity that I write about has had many names. It was called the right. And then when Walter was writing, it was the new right, which meant we had to rename the old right, the old right. It's been called the moral majority with lowercase letters, at not, not the organization, but just as a movement. Uh, it's been called the Tea Party. Sometimes it's just called evangelicalism, and now we're calling it Christian nationalism. The name changing has several implications, one of which is the loss of the thread running through all of these, the coherence and consistency of both the way they see the world and their plans for the rest of us. The name changing leads us to focus on surface issues, like the next election cycle, that while important, also distracts us from what Walter pointed us to, the cultural transformation sought by the religious right that was, in his time, slowly and methodically taking place. The result is to obscure the real threat this admittedly theocratic movement poses to democracy. Let's make sure I'm on this. Okay. Actually, I'm one behind. There we go. 
More than 30 years ago, Walter warned not to dismiss this movement out of hand. He pressed for the necessity of understanding the power of the movement that came from its internal coherence, the consistency with which its followers were willing to work over the long term to bring about the change they sought. Specifically, I write about an obscure but important thread in Christian nationalism called Christian Reconstructionism. In the middle of the 20th century, Christian Reconstructionists drew on parts of the Calvinist Reform tradition in a, in, and in, Pro, in Calvinist Reform tradition in Protestantism and the Old and New Testaments to develop what they call a biblical worldview. In this view, the Bible speaks to every area of life, and it's the job of Christians to bring biblical law to bear on every realm of culture and society. Santa Barbara is a bubble. And for those of you who didn't come from away, as we say in Maine, where I'm really from, um, I don't know that that language resonates and that you recognize the, the depth of it and what, what, what it is really meant by all of it. Um, I live in Florida. And the, this, is, this is the way people talk. This movement has infused the way people see things. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So um, they call this the dominion mandate from, from that given to Adam in the book of Genesis. And they intend for us to be a theocracy. Or, uh, more than articulating a theological system, the Christian Reconstructionists knew that to bring about their goals, they needed a multi, they called it a multi-generational strategy to capture the institutions of society and change how people think. A key part of this has been the effort to dismantle and replace public education with private Christian education. And I'm sad to report that in many of the country, many parts of the country, they're having a lot of success. Educational choice, parental rights, they sound like great advances until we see the big picture. Or as an important Christian Reconstructionist figure, Gary North, put it in 1982, so let us be blunt about it. We must use the doctrine of religious liberty to gain independence for Christian schools until we train up a generation of people who know that there is no religious neutrality, no neutral law, no neutral education, no neutral civil government. Then they will get busy constructing a Bible-based social, political, and religious order, which finally denies the religious liberty to the enemies of God. There are far too many components of this Bible-based social, political, and religious order to outline here. But since the 1960s with the Christian school movement, then later with the Christian homeschool movement and exploding with the pandemic, this obscure version of Christianity has remade the separatist fundamentalism of the 1920s into a serious theocratic challenge to democracy. In the process, it has overtaken what was a broader evangelical movement and the Republican Party. I don't know how many of you watched the Republican debate earlier this week, but the attacks on universities came from every candidate, repeatedly and more aggressively than I've seen. And like I said, I live in Florida. Christian Reconstructionists have written publicly about their views and their goals for decades. But at the same time, they have functioned as something of a stealth movement. People dismissed them in the ways that Walter warned about. When I, along with a handful of others, began writing publicly about them in popular media around 2010, we were dismissed as alarmist by some who claimed that dominionism isn't a real thing. It's a real thing, isn't it? We've been talking about this. <laughs> Christian Reconstructionist broader influence is hidden. Sometimes that's because it's embedded in institutions and has taken hold among people who are unaware of its roots or its long-term goals. But this isn't unusual. None of us can really trace the roots of our ways of thinking. We might be able to hit some of the high points, but most of our sources get lost along the way. And that's true for those of us who spend our time thinking about thinking. Those of us who would like to be able to trace all the sources. Most people don't even care. Other times people embrace these ideas but reject the controversial label. 
There are a number of religious right leaders and institutions who have demonstrable ties to R.J. Rushduni, one of the founders, and Christian Reconstructionism, but they don't wish for that to be known. You cannot track the influence of this movement by looking for footnotes and finding people who identify explicitly by the label. You have to listen for it. If you really understand their framing, if you understand their world from the inside, instead of dismissing them as not really Christian or just too far on the fringe to bother with, if you don't do that, you can start to hear their accent. And this brings me back to Walter's influence. One of the biggest challenges in my work has been scholars who want me to be able to supply traditional documentary evidence for the influence that I claim. I understand that, but it's not possible. And if we want to know how this relatively powerful faction in America, if we want to know what they're up to, we need, to, we need the deeper understanding that Walter sought. The deeper understanding gives us access to the bigger picture. We have to see if we're going to address it. Importantly, it also helps us see, or better hear, the influence. I have some examples as I shift to the discussion of the importance of public scholarship. Like Walter, I never intended to be an ivory tower kind of scholar. Even less than Walter, I'm a lot more likely to go hang out with the Moonies than I am to dig through dusty old papers. So I count myself lucky when I get calls asking me to explain some development among the Christian nationalists. I do that because I still don't like to call them that, but I should stop. I've got to get over it. That's what everybody's calling them now, right? I know this world from the inside out, and I can identify an influence that others might miss. It's in the language that they use. These are some examples. They talk about a biblical worldview. They use the language of patriarchs or patriarchy in a positive way. They talk about government schools instead of public schools. They talk about civil government instead of government. They talk about lesser magistrates. This actually comes from Calvin, but they're interested in dismantling the federal state and they aren't satisfied with states' rights. They want actually county rights. So the discussion of lesser magistrates has to do with what they think is the power of local sheriffs to invalidate existing law because they have biblical authority to do so based on Calvin. Um, they talk about biblical spheres of authority, which actually encompass everything. Um, they talk about dominion. And they talk about covenant marriage. And this isn't to say that anybody who uses any of these terms is somehow a secret Christian reconstructionist. But it is to claim that when contemporary discourse is consistently punctuated by these rather unusual terms, it's likely to have come from Christian reconstructionists. And it's reasonable to inquire whether it also comes with a host of views about the world shaped by dominion theology. Most recently, I've been explaining to anyone who would listen lots of reporters, that our new speaker of the house, Mike Johnson, has been drinking from the Christian Reconstructionist well. OK. <laughs> I get asked if Johnson is a Christian Reconstructionist. And I don't like that question. I think it's the wrong question. The answer is I don't know. Maybe that's why I think it's the wrong question. Huh? What I do know is that along the way, in his involvement among Baptists, Christian schools, and probably homeschooling, he has incorporated their way of thinking into his own. It doesn't mean he is one, but it means the influence is there. You can hear the echoes of it when they use these strange terms. Johnson began his term as speaker by claiming that God had put him in authority. And he said in an interview that the Bible is the source of his views on all issues. Most Americans hear these kinds of statements in traditional ways politicians have sought to solemnize our civic life, akin to in God we trust on our money. While some of us may not like it, generally it's harmless. But these kinds of statements are a window into the way he understands the relationship between religion and government. And we should be paying attention. He's not just suggesting he looks to the wisdom of the biblical tradition to inform his positions. He's echoing a version of Christianity that literally teaches that the Bible, both Old and New Testament, speaks to every area of life. He's drawing on a way of reading those texts that prescribes everything from tax rates and the necessity of having insurance to whether regulating the internet is possible. Johnson has added a new term to my lexicon of language to look for. He's in a covenant marriage. Because Christian Reconstructionists built their system on the Reformed tradition and Calvinism, the notion of covenantalism is central. 
For a couple of decades now, churches in these circles have added their own sorts of requirement to the legal requirements for marriage and called these covenant marriages. The most important components are that the covenant puts the marriage under the authority of the church and makes divorce much more difficult. In many examples of covenant marriage, only the church courts can grant divorces. In most states in the US, the practice exists only within church congregations and apart from the state. But in a few US states where power of this kind of Christianity has been enough to enact such laws, Johnson's state of Louisiana being one of them, a similar process has been written into secular law. Scholarship should matter. And as intractable as, seems, as it seems that things are now, I can't help but wonder what Walter would say to us to do about it. Walter blended town and gown with grace. He didn't just use his expertise to weigh in on public issues. He used it to bring people along in their understanding so they could see what he saw. But he was able to maintain his hopefulness. I wish I were able to do that. The breadth of the arenas where Walter has contributed to public life is truly hard to grasp. We'll be hearing about some of the more well-known examples, but the true breadth was clear to me when I kind of randomly encountered an example about which I had known nothing. I spend as much time as I can these days in my camper. I'm looking for Clarence Thomas at Walmart. <laughs> A couple of years ago, I was in a county park in San Luis Obispo and noticed a sign dedicating a lamp preserve to Walter Capps. I went up and looked around. I still don't know what it was about. I have no idea how that came to be. The people at the kiosk didn't know. But almost 25 years after his death, the new to me realization of the good that he brought to the world in ways both big and small made me smile. So I guess that's a little bit of hope. Thank you. You're going to set me up. Okay. I've got myself timed here. I'm going to make it big so I can see it. Awesome. Great. Um, and I am actually going to use one of these mics. Um, because I've been furiously taking notes and want to integrate some of the themes that have come up into my talk today, which is on hope, and maybe that's a good, a good note. Can, you know, before we get started, and before I do the thank of everybody, can everybody just stand up and stretch? <laughs> like, do a little teapot stretch? Yeah. Woo. Woo. Yes, roll those shoulders. Okay, great. All right, now, now we're ready to dive into hope. <laughs> um, so I appreciate the breadth that we were given to, um, the breadth that we were given to interpret this assignment of coming and talking at this conference. Um, and uh, there are so many things I could say about my own personal experiences with Walter and how he was a beloved uncle-like person in my life. And um, often when I was feeling that kind of angsty doctoral student feel, um, the way he would just radiate positivity, hope, and would um, bring light to that sort of doom and gloom. And then also whatever drama was going on at the university, he was so able to, at least with us as students, interject this kind of humor into it and um, encourage us not to take ourselves so seriously, um, but to have a light touch. And so this actually comes into my discussion today of eco talk, uh, or eco talk, and these Gen Z eco communicators that are really going across the zeitgeist of doom and gloom um, in terms of climate and are defiantly embracing and preaching climate hope. Um, so I'm gonna dig into that a little bit, but I think I may have solved Tomoko's uh, question of what the conference that was keynoted by Moltmann was about. I believe it was about hope, 
And uh, the future of hope, I, I think that was the conference, that, that, that was the publication that came out of the conference. Uh, but one of the things that's been really lovely in doing this new project on Gen Zers and uh, the digital space as a space of a preaching, encouraging, I wrote uh, big, strong um, stars here, galvanizing hope among Gen Zers, among younger generations, has been going back to Walter's texts about hope and, um, and thinking with them. So a couple of themes that I pulled out, among other aspects, is um, Walter explored in writing and teaching and policy making, changing narratives of hope, the contrariness of hope, and I'm going to mention that today in my talk, St the structural dynamism of hope mu movements, um, you know, how is it that there's sort of this school of hope he's talking about in the mid-60s, and then by the mid-1970s, he famously in the chapter um, of Hope Against Hope asks where, what the heck happened, where is hope, <laughs> what happened to hope? Um, the multiplicity and flexibility of hope, the entwined sociopolitics and implied theologies of hope. And finally, I want to concentrate on this last one, the inextricable ties between hope and imagination, particularly the capacity to imagine a better future and how that has implications for our very survival. So it's early days yet, but this is what the project looks like right now. Defiant climate hope, how Gen Z, what I call anti-doomers, are fueling climate action through their eco-communications and their um, defiant hope-filled media making. So some of this also comes out of a hope-filled course. I teach at Northwestern University for undergraduates and have for a number of years. I teach both in religious studies and in environmental policy and culture. And students were coming into my class largely from environmental policy and culture and environmental science, and every climate course they had taken had depressed the bejesus out of them. And after taking the course, they would say, hey, this was the first course I've taken on climate change that didn't make me want to slip my wrists. <laughs> so one of the reasons for that, and that was by design, is in this course, I take this very soul-crushing, despair-inducing topic, but we get active in this course. So we make climate media in this course. As Juan mentioned, I went and got a degree in media studies after graduating with my PhD at UCSB in part so that I could do this and write about this. Um, so the first part of the course is we're analyzing climate media. What works? What doesn't? What's effective? How do we thread the needle of getting people concerned and moving them from concern into action without making people shut down from climate paralysis and climate anxiety. And it is a hard needle to thread. Um, it is very easy for fear-based media communications to just, we've all done that. We've seen the headlines and we have just scrolled back down those headlines and just can't, can't hear it, can't engage. And so we learn some strategies for how to get people to engage. And the students make their own media, and then we workshop that media in learning pods, and we get better at it. And they bring their own research um, on climate to, um, and become better climate communicators in the process. So part of my observing the students making their media, my students are Gen Zers, and I'll talk a little about generations in a second, um, part of that and watching them make their own media and then looking at a lot of the media that they're looking at it at brought up uh, repeatedly this realm of eco-talk. So when I talk about eco-talk, uh, there are two realms here. There's a specific collective that calls themselves eco-talk of communicators who make all sorts of videos to organize, to um, educate about um, climate, to activate uh, Gen Z and millennials mostly on TikTok to be involved in climate action. And then eco-talk is, is also used more broadly to talk about that sort of digital space where Gen Zs are making um, 
m making videos and making media about this. Um, but they're, they're educating, they're talking about policy efficacy, and one of the things that's encouraging to me as someone who wrote a book, my last book was on eco-piety and green media and how we need to shift the conversation from those tiny little micro changes, like I've got a bamboo toothbrush and I, I used a paper straw instead of a plastic straw, and uh, I recycled my coffee cup, all of that is great and we should all be doing that. However, comma, in terms of the speed, scope, and scale that we need to make, to address climate change in a way the Earth will actually notice, <laughs> takes policy. So my, my, my repeated uh, mantra in my class to my students is policy. It's what's for breakfast. It is what's for breakfast. And what's encouraging to see with these anti-doomers on TikTok, on EcoTalk, is they're getting that policy matters in terms of speed, scope, and scale to actually make a difference. Of the scale, we made a difference when we had agreements to ban uh, uh, ozone-depleting CFC chemicals and, uh, and other chemicals that, thank goodness that we did, because the climate change problem would be even worse had we not. So that's the kind of corporate, um, meaning all of us together acting, that's the kind of impact that we can have. And they, um, my students integrate that into their media works and they look for that in terms of the media that they are consuming. So when I talk about climate hope, I often get the question, um, is, oh, you know, Sarah, is this, all, is this all rainbows and unicorns and lollipops? You know, come on with the climate hope. We know we're all doomed. Um, what's kind of interesting is on these eco-talks made by these anti-doomers, um, they acknowledge, they are not sugarcoating, they acknowledge climate grief and despair is real. They have been pickled in it throughout their education. Um, many of them, at least at Northwestern, they have been, but many of them on TikTok talk about um, having nightmares about climate change from the fifth grade on. Um, but they're also, at the same time, acknowledging that this is real. They're rejecting fatalism and galvanizing their viewers to enact systemic change. They're also a community of care and a commun as well as a community of hope. Here's one of um, EcoTalk's, um, it's actually not their most recent post, but one of their most recent posts is entitled Resist Climate Doom. And here I have circled in my notes from your talk, Ed, a world given formation by hope, not fear. And how much this ties in um, to Walter's, as Julie said, refusal to be cynical, refusal to give up. Right, so sending this message, hope is more, it is more sustainable than fear. And then I love this comment here, joy is a form of resistance. That doesn't mean not being active, that doesn't mean sitting on your sofa, but this is actually borrowed, um, there's a lot of overlap between Black Lives Matter activists and eco-talkers, and this is actually comes from Karen Waldron's book, The Lightmaker's Manifesto, uh, if you've read that, where she says, I refuse to feel guilty about feeling joy, even though the world is totally messed up and screwed up. That, that, that you owe yourself, what are you doing it all for? if you're not stopping and feeling the joy. And what's neat is that, that we're seeing these eco-talkers also saying, hey, don't forget joy. And that's what Walter was saying to us. As graduate students, when we were in our angsty doom and gloom, oh my God, and you know, we're gonna, don't forget joy. Because what are you doing that to grieve for? Or when everything was going horribly in, the co in Congress, well, it's pretty discouraging, but, even so, don't forget joy. What are we doing it for, if not? Um, so here's another, another posting that I love from EcoTalk. Um, they're promoting open, um, open EDU, which is um, a, um, it's a climate change education program. But I love this image here. Where here they have two roots depicted. One is towards outrage, clickbait, polarizing news, sensational doom and gloom. But there's another route that we can take, they say. 
there's a little bit of an off-ramp that goes in a different direction. And what is that direction? Solutions, creativity, innovation, storytelling, science, indigenous knowledge, open education, uh, community, care, healing, joy, trust. All of these things that have come up today. Um, so when I talk about these proponents of defiant hope, what do I mean by defiant? Um, what, are, what are they defying? Well, we know from a number of studies, and I'm just going to mention two. One is from the Ipso Global Market Research uh, Public Opinion Data, uh, their solutions survey, um, that was a survey of 20,000 people in 27 countries, that one in five young people globally believe it's too late to fix climate change. We're screwed. It's too late. Go have a cheeseburger, sit on the beach. You know, might as well enjoy the way down. Um, so this kind of fatalism is also reflected in the young people's voices of climate anxiety um, study that was done. Britt Ray, who's up at um, Stanford, was also um, involved in the study. She very famously wrote this book, Gen Dread. This is another uh, phrase for um, both Gen Zers and younger millennials. Um, Jen Dredd surveyed more than 10,000 15 to 25-year-olds 20, from more than 10 countries. Three quarters of the young people reported feeling the future is frightening. Half said humanity is doomed and reported that climate anxiety impacts their day-to-day -day lives. 39% fear bringing children into the world wrecked by climate crisis. And this tracks with my students, too. Many of my students say, I will not have, to, I mean, they're undergraduates, but they are saying, I will not have children. It is not ethically, morally fair to bring children into a wrecked world. So when I say defiant hope, and when Walter talks about the contrariness of hope, here we have in the eco-talk, anti-doomer movement, contrariness, right? Defiant hope going on. And this is what they are defying, the sort of prevailing zeitgeist, as it were. So anti-doomers defy fatalism. Um, we also know from a number of psychological and sociological research that's been doing, doing uh, that's been done. Um, any of us who talk at teach at university, we know that there's a huge mental crisis going on with our students, and yes, exacerbated by the pandemic. But here, the climate anxiety is a huge, huge component of why our students are having major, major mental meltdowns. They are carrying the world, the, the weight of a burning world on their shoulders. So these eco-talkers, these anti-doomers are defying the fatalism in this, defying the zeitgeist um, going on. There's being contrarian, and they're making it fun. Uh, TikTok is famous for their dances. Raise your hand if you have ever done a TikTok dance. Come on. Who, what? We're the only two? Oh, y'all are liars. Nobody's done a TikTok. Thank you. Thank you. This man has done a TikTok dance. Um, so the, the genre, the platform itself is fun. Um, it's playful. And we've talked a lot today about Walter's sense of fun and playfulness, that you walk in the room with Walter and you just felt the warmth, the warmth and the playfulness and the laughing, the smile that goes, reaches his eyes because he had that kind of laughter and spirit. So this happens to be uh, not just sort of silly, trivial. We want to dismiss the, uh, Sean, I think what you called the eco-talk generation. We want to dismiss them. But this is incredibly smart and strategic. First of all, doing this on TikTok, location, location, location. In addressing their peers to peer-to-peer -peer conversation, they're going where their peers are. Their peers aren't going to somber documentary environmental climate films. Their peers are on TikTok. My teen is on TikTok. Um, so using humor to address climate change rather than being sort of silly and superficial, this is brilliantly strategic. And if you don't believe me, you can read Max Boykoff's research at CU Boulder. We read his book on creative climate communications in my media course. And he finds, guess what? When you are dealing with soul-crushing 
uh, existentially uh, devastating topics, if you can have a light touch, the way Walter often had a light touch, if you can have a light touch, guess what? People can go there. They can go there. They won't be paralyzed and shut down. So rather than the funny, silly approach being sort of flippant, it's brilliant. Here's an example. This is um, Zahra Biabani. She is a popular um, TikToker and media and eco-communicator. I don't know if anybody follows her here. Um, her TED Talk, where she talks about how Gen Z can become eco-creators in the digital space and help fuel climate action through this, making media as a bridge to policy, as a bridge to galvanizing support for policies that the Earth's going to actually notice. So here she is doing her TikTok dance. Then she does her very serious tech talk, uh, but she also writes books. So let's not dismiss our TikTokers as being relatively illiterate and not doing serious work. But here is her book on climate optimism, and I added this little arrow here because she says in the subtitle here, celebrating systemic change around the world. Once again, she's getting it. It's, you know, a pox upon the plastic straws, but it's not about the plastic straws. It's about broader policy changes. Um, I also receive her um, weekly um, uh, newsletter, which is fabulous because each week there's a subject heading in my inbox that says, Earth wins. Earth wins. And it's a list of good things that happened in terms of climate change and the environment that week. Not the doom and gloom stuff. And she makes a point, do we need to be working faster? Do we need to be doing more? Absolutely frickin' utly. But here we have earth winds. Here's an example of earth winds. And, there's a, and this is a feature done on her on, in Seventeen magazine. So she's really resonating with a younger demographic. And then she has action items. And I love that her action items aren't, uh, aren't you know, you, Greg, personally, please do not drink almond milk that is unfriendly to bees. Instead, she says, help save bees by urging leaders to ban pesticides. She's thinking big. Policy. It's what's for breakfast. Um, but there's also a little double entendre that's often used with the earth winds. It's that this, this defiant hope, earth is going to win out in the end, and let's keep going. She also takes a page out of um, climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe's book. This is an excellent book if you haven't read it, A Climate Scientist Cape for, Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World. And we actually study, and, and uh, Catherine Hayhoe also did a famous uh, YouTube series. Um, she does great um, she does great uh, Instagram posts. She does a lot of social media. She's brilliant at this, but we dissect in class her climate communications. But I love this. She'll talk about, like, what's going wrong. And instead of saying, like, soul-crushing, depressing, you're going to want to curl up in, in a fetal position after this news, she says, not so good news, uh, which helps us go there, helps us not shut down. And then she follows that by good news, Earth wins, things that we can be excited about. Is it happening quickly enough? No, let's make it happen more and, and, and more quickly. And then she always has a section on what you can do with what we call in class ridiculously easy steps to action. And in fact, my students, when they're graded on their projects, they get points based upon at the end of their media project, what are the ridiculously easy steps to action, and she always includes this. And I, we see this also reflected in some of the eco-talkers, where um, they do their eco-talk and then they have um, ridiculously um, easy steps to action. Uh, she is sending the message over and over and over again, in, in many ways and forms, we are not doomed. S -s Framing climate as being a formidable but solvable problem. So here we all know the OK Boomer retort to the older generation. Here we see a peer-to-peer -peer communication going on of OK Doomer. 
as they're pitching this kind of defiant hope. Um, another uh, you know, strong media presence in the digital space is Leah Thomas. Um, and I, I love when she writes here, she's the author of Inter The Intersectional Environmentalist. She has a whole bunch of social media sites having to do with this. But she says, unlike millennials who identify as climate pes pessimists, a lot of Gen Zers identify with climate fatalism. They believe there is no hope. I get so mad when I see climate communications that say there's no hope, the world's ending. The kids aren't all right. They have eco-anxiety. We have to stop that. So she's talking about it. Shutes Kat Martinez, who I featured in my Eco Piety book, and I feature more in this project, who is an indigenous rapper and a climate activist and co creator of the Guardians, uh, Earth Guardians, as a, uh, a youth climate activist organization. He too is sending the message hope fuels action, despair dismantles it. So all of these major. Um, themes come up in the EcoTalk media making. And just, I know I'm, oh, I see, I'm about to get the cane. So, but I just want to address before that what climate hope means when we use this term climate hope. And it seems that the eco-talkers are talking about hope in the way that Ellen Kelsey, if you know her work, Hope Matters, um, and she's also been a fellow at, um, at, at Stanford. She talks about the difference a, a, a between hope and wishful thinking, that hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is not a pathological Pollyanna delusion. That hope she's referring to is evidence-based hope. And that's part of what Catherine Hayhoe and the other eco-talkers are doing when they post Earth Winds. Ways we're transitioning, ways we're making a difference, things that are going in the right direction, evidence-based hope. Um, and then these Gen Z eco-communicators are making the, um, the, the um, point, and then I'll conclude on this, that climate denial and climate fatalism are two sides of the coin of inaction because the climate fatalism creates this climate paralysis or this eco-anxiety paralysis, and that leads to inaction too. Um, that hope is a verb with its sh shirt sleeves rolled up, as David Orr says, or as Rebecca Solnick says, hope is not a lottery ticket. You can sit on the sofa and clutch feeling lucky. Hope is an ax you break down doors with in an emergency. And I, I, I guess I'm out of time, so I'll leave it at that. I had much more to tell you, but <laughs> maybe you can do that in Q&A. I don't believe in canes. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, they're preparing a great reception for us right now, but, but in order to get to the reception, we have to have questions for our panelists. And uh, Dusty and Greg, would it be okay to have chairs up front? Where are we coming? Okay. And I'll get the uh, Great. microphones ready. We'll have two for the panel and we'll have a third microphone for persons asking questions. Ladies and gentlemen. I, uh, we're going to wait for just a moment that uh, our, our wonderful McCune interns right now, are, who are volunteering to help us today, are bringing uh, chairs out for the five panelists to come and, and take a seat. Uh, we'll have two microphones for the panelists, and I'll, have, I'll circulate a microphone for audience questions. Uh, when you do speak, because this is being recorded for video and live streamed, uh, for our audiences who are not physically present in the room today, please do speak directly into the microphone. Thank you so Great. much. So Let's cool. thank our McCune interns, please. Yeah. Ed and Sarah, come on up. <laughs> One more round. <laughs> uh, Juan, will you call? And I'll just carry the microphone. Sure. Yeah. Just wait all the panelists to get up. <laughs> All right, we have first question. Hi. Uh, yes, this is for the last, uh, the last speaker. When, when you speak of uh, we in, uh, in climate optimism, who is, which is the we that you're talking about? Is it, is it we, the people who have access to university uh, privilege in, in the United States of America? Is it we worldwide? Is it the 
generation now? Is it, is it our, our generation and ancestors? Is it our generation and descendants? Or uh, our generation and descendants for 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years? Which, which we are we talking about? Right, well, um, in terms of this project, what I can say is um, I'm looking at a subset of Gen Z eco-communicators, as I'm calling them, um, who are really bucking, as I said, the sort of zeitgeist of the doom and gloom zeitgeist. Um, what I'm finding, and, and I should back up, so part of this is media ethnography, part of this is auto ethnography from teaching my class, um, my students, um, and then part of it, uh, then the last part of it will be focus groups um, with Gen Z um, climate writers and um, media makers and talking with them. Um, so I, one of the things I'm finding, and it's early days so far in this project, um, but I am finding that this is a diverse group of media makers um, from all sorts of walks of life um, and different ethnic backgrounds, different class backgrounds. That's something that's really surprised me because traditionally, as we know, a lot of the environmental movement um, has been associated with white males um, and, and, and that kind of per, per, perspectives and voices in that, that uh, coming from that perspective. Um, what I would say is, um, in terms of the ubiquitous we, I, don't, I think this is very targeted media making. Um, it's being made by Gen Zers to Gen Zers who have given up, who uh, think there is no hope for their future. And um, what's interesting is they're also gleaning information from, um, from climate scientists like Michael Mann at University of Pennsylvania who are saying, hey, by the way, by giving up hope and by resigning ourselves to the fact that it's just too late, we are doing the bidding of the fossil fuel industry, and he actually um, cites instances of the fossil fuel industry stoking this, stoking this fatal, mm -hmm. fatalism, this, this fatalistic approach. And he says, yeah, it plays right into their hands. Um, what's interesting is this subset, uh, the group, is saying the jig is up. We know that um, the minute we give up, you win. Um, so I'm not sure there's a universal we going on. I think there's a very particular Gen Z to Gen Z communication going on. Thank you very much. Yes, in, th in the front row. Thank you so much. I also have a question for you. I don't know if it's more universal, but I feel like the sofa and the beach got a bad rap. Um, you know, but I've been thinking about it in this way. I'm really kidding. But what I'm thinking about it maybe is just because I've been in Mississippi with, you know, 600 African-American women writers. But I think, too, about Tricia Hershey's work and, like, rest is resistance. And hearing, hearing Alice Walker very surprisingly talk about happiness, that's, like, what she's writing and thinking about right now. As of last week, she actually started a dance party at this conference. So, speaking of dances, but her point was justice, yes, but pursuing justice, but not at the cost of your life. And so I'm just trying to think about, is there, I'm just thinking about a lens for sort of 400 years of racial history on this, where who's doing like the labor and who's doing the work and this, what I'm hearing lately from some African American female scholars, which is like, you know what? I am resting, like I am sitting on the sofa, I am going to the beach or whatever my self-care looks like, you know, you've created this world, speaking of the we, you know, and I, that's not to say that the climate justice folks are, are not people of color. I'm just thinking about for that sort of history of racial violence, like, I don't know, I'm just trying to think about how all that 
fits into this picture. Right. So I may have misspoken with the beach and the cheeseburger. The only reason why that came to mind is at one point I was in class with my students and um, they brought up a friend of theirs who is a huge doom and gloomer. And um, every time they bring up climate evidence with him, you know, whatever he just says, oh, I don't care. I'm just sort I think of it's very, I think it's enjoying real, the ride but down. But I hear what you're saying. But uh, I didn't get to my slides of uh, Mary Anise Heglar's Work. She is uh, a, a climate writer, a climate activist, and she's African American. And she talks about um, the privilege of what she calls Doomer Dude. And Lisa, if you're still here, I, I know Lisa, know, you know her work, and I don't know whether you use her work, but she talks about the privilege of these uh, going to work in the climate space, but having all of these predominantly white Doomer dudes say, oh, you know, um, the earth's going to be fine, humans will all be killed off, the earth will flourish without us, it's just going to happen. Um, and, and being completely okay with that and almost having a gleeful self-satisfaction in the fact that the earth will be wiped clean. Of um, and, and this goes back to your we question. Um, the, so these doomer dudes are like, oh, we as humans have had our chance on this planet. And she gets outraged of... How have uh, humans who are not in positions of power and advantage had their chance? How have children born onto this earth had their chance? Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great, um, and Leah Thomas is doing a lot of this great climate communicating, but yes, this rest. Um, a, a lot of them cite the Karen Waldron book, The Lightmaker's Manifesto, where she does say, Resting is resistance. Thank you very much, you. Sarah. Could we have a, a, a questions for another panelist too? Yeah, Sean, yeah. I'll get to you. You'll be next. So, this is actually because I want to link what Sarah said with what um, Tomoko and Wendy were saying. Because a light bulb just went on for me listening to the sort of three of you. Julie, many light bulbs went on listening to you as well. But um, I want to stay on hope. Can I? Can, I just don't want to be so gloomy. If that's okay. Um, <laughs> Although I did, I did see the word intersectional in Sarah's slide, and I'm using your methodology of looking for language and listening for language. So there, there, that was, that's that's data too, right? The use of contemporary um, jargon to to build bridges. But um, Havel comes up and doesn't come up, and of course Havel has this great definition of hope, right? Um, not as it's 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 deeper than optimism, and that was my in, that was my primary. Um, language with Walter and with Lisa in 1995 and 1996. And so what the light bulb that went on for me listening to Tomoko and Wendy and then Sarah just sort of like went, whoa, is this concept that maybe for Walter, you know, he was so fascinated with Havel. He was bringing Havel in as from phenomenological roots, first of all, his essay on Havel goes all the way back to Husserl because of, because of Havel and Patochka and um, Masaryk and Husserl. There's a genealogy there, but also potentially because he saw Havel as a kind of a peer. Um, and I wanted to put that idea out there because I don't know if we're going to be able to talk about Havel a lot more over the next day or so. He was so important to Walter, and it just, this notion of mysticism and the notion of um, the notion of these challenges makes me wonder out loud whether for Walter seeing Havel as a kind of mirror person. Havel the playwright dealing with the gloom and doom of social, state socialism and the oppression of state socialism and here's Havel emerging and here's Walter emerging from the humanities in freedom. Walter had freedoms that Havel didn't have and they're both landing in government in some way. And I just wonder if there's, there's a conversation there that I just wish he, I wish he had, I wish he were around, right? This is the conversation I would want to be having with him today. Let's hear one of the panelists respond. Who would like to do, respond to that? <laughs> Put you on the spot. <laughs> No response. Okay. Yes, sir. That's a Over here? No. Uh, that's a fascinating thing. I, I'm not sure I can speak to all of what Walter um, and you have had a conversation about Havel. Um, I, I do think 
from my longtime engagement with Walter. I mean, he was both, you know, a positive personality that he had one of those sort of buoyant whatever. At the same time, I think that the very last quote I did from the Sacred Fire book points to something that even with the pathos and the complexity of reality, he still had this deep sense of the benevolence of what is sustaining everything. And I mean, that, that is a profoundly religious apprehension. Um, he, did, he, he allowed it to have a lot of space in it. He didn't you know, put particular doctrines associated with that. But the, the deep interior, and it's, it's the kind of hope that's not, um, um, I, years ago we were in Haiti, um, and I, one of the things that really struck me about Haiti is that there was no evident, and it's even worse now, no evident sort of reason that there should be this profound, buoyant embrace of simply being that was evident there. And it was hope that was different than it was, and it wasn't just an eschatological hope, um, but it was a hope that, and, and I th that there is indeed, even in the midst of all of it, something that is so much more profound and fundamental. Um, and I think it's sad when, you know, doomers will say, oh, well, the earth's just going to take care of itself. And that, but that's a, that's a kind of a um, cheap version of that, you know, I think. But that, that somehow we as human persons as well have this responsibility to, to more deeply ground ourselves in, um, in the ultimate benevolence of ourselves and one another. Thank, Thank you very much, Wendy. Yes, sir. You're, okay. John, yes. No, I have a time? Yes, there are time. Um, <laughs> can you hear me? Pardon? Can you hear me? Yes, <laughs> you can hear me. Okay. So, um, first of all, um, that was a great, great panel, fantastic. I, I, with respect to Sean's question, it seems to me he already knows the answer, but obviously um, somebody like Walter would be more attracted to continental philosophy rather than going through the analytical, philosophical, sort of rational agent kind of thing. So, I mean, somebody mentioned Buber earlier. But um, I have a question that has to do with with it, with, it, with what you guys all talked about, um, although maybe maybe uh, Tomoko had more specific. I mean, he had that, she had, you had the beautiful uh, example of the syllabus. I mean, it was very precious. Yeah. So the question is a question about general generalability, or uh, uh, in in terms of, of Walter Capps as as an exceptional kind of teacher, mentor, obviously for all of you, um, and the kind of engaged teacher also that he was. Um, but, but also scholarly, all of you are talking about scholarly that had an impact on you and also even in, as you show in the organization of, of a course and what you expect from the students, all this. The question is, a, is a question that's been asked many times, which is, do you think it's, it's possible to generalize that? I mean, in other words, it's possible maybe even to make it institutionalize it. In other words, how, how do you go from a, what everybody is agreeing upon saying, he was an exceptional person for in this in these respects, at least, and the ones that have been that, uh, discussed. I mean, how do you go from there? Can, is there, it's just a one-on-one? -on -one? Is again the fact that the, after all, as graduate, I think graduate students can show uh, you have shown the, the the apprenticeship model. I mean, it's, it's always like a really winning one, including with undergrads or with others. I mean, it's a fantastic thing when we can do it. But can you can you turn it into something? I mean, into something that is more than have, having to do with an individual, you know, person who has specific kind of uh, uh, sensibilities and skills. Should I go? Okay. Uh, well, thank you uh, for, because, you know, that question has often occurred to me. Uh, of course, we want to celebrate 
And in a way, we are talking 40, 50 years after the fact from the time of our you know, generation. Of, and I often wondered, I mean, this is what I have learned, because I, after all, entered the same profession, even though, of course, the kind of work that I ended up doing is very different in the social relation to the rest of the world. His and mine are very different. And yet, I feel that I think about my relation to Walter much more than anything else is because there were so many moments I thought, is he being reckless? He's saying, I can do it. Uh, was he right? I mean, he was as if like, he wasn't just going around saying every, every time or to everybody. He made it like this was an important moment that I should not fra become frail. Don't waver or don't be afraid. Uh, you know, it may or may not work, but it will be all right. Uh, it's worth it, and you're still young, you got to do it. So that was message that I thought I was interpreting what he was saying, but he was, I wasn't sure. You know, in those moments in the back, I kept thinking, well, what if he's wrong? He's just being optimistic, right? And yet, I think this is the dynamic that goes on between the teacher and the student over and over. And this is so intimate and important. Uh, and it's so forgotten in the days of instant re course review. Hmm. You just won't know what this is. Or if that's your focus, then you won't have this relation. So to me, I mean, Quite literally, I meant it. He's been my teacher all these years because I'm testing, you know, well, was he right about this, right? Uh, and, and, and so on. And he made that experience naked. Uh, you know, I think you could say probably about every teacher, you know, if they really care about students at all, uh, this kind of relation. I don't think it's a unique, but he made it sort of not possible to ignore. And so I can't say that always, every moment I thought he was right, or that, oh yeah, I can run with this. No, I said, well, he went to Yale. So here I am in the graduate program that was barely 10 years old. What does he know? What my experience or my prospect, right? I'm not a native speaker of English. I come from very different kinds of things. So, I mean, you know, there was all these kind of hope uh, or doubts. And yet, somehow, he encouraged me to put it together. Okay, hold on. Hold on, you know, and, and, and so on. Another, pe another piece of that, it seems to me, is, I mean, just looking at the five of us, I mean, these are not five peas in a pod. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, totally. Um, and, and yet, somehow the encounter with, with Walter and some of those generative ideas and the way he was moving in life as a pilgrimage, really, as you suggested, Ed, and that he then saw in each of us something different in each of us. We were not carbon copies. We were not, you know, graduate students who were supposed to, you know, put on his resume or something like that. It was absolutely distinctive for each of us. And he really brought, he, he allowed that to come forward and he encouraged it. I mean, and went out of his way to, to do that. There was this radical kind of individuality about it. I thought it was, I think it's amazing. Here we are. We can take, uh, oh, Julie, did you want to say something? No. Okay. We can take one more question, but please keep it brief to a question. Yes. Yes, sir. I, I think it's demonstrated perfectly in, in Tomoko's syllabus that she put up on the screen what we're talking about. And to me, what it is, it's entirely nonverbal, right? What I would call liminal intelligence, and I'll, I'll illustrate that for a moment, and I'll be brief. I didn't know Walter personally. 
I only knew him through my dad, okay? My dad loved Walter, okay? So I came to know Walter through my dad's love, and it was symbolic. It reminds me of when I would speak with a Chumash elder, and I'm so glad you invoked that. I would speak with Grandfather Semba, and we'd have these long silences in between each verbal representation of spirit or what we're trying to communicate. So it invoked liminal intelligence for what, what I call liminal intelligence. And to me, Dad was imparting to me something that I think he was embraced by from Walter, right? That was entirely non-literal, non-academic, right? And yet so universal in the sense that hope, the, the theme of hope, right, is in all of us. And if we don't have that, what do we have? And I think that's the theme. I think of the undercurrent, the underlying spirit of all this. And I hope that expresses the love that my dad had for Walter. Any comments? Okay, so hearing this language of hope it combined with action, it reminds me of the words of John Lewis, let's make good trouble. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much, everybody. We have a great reception for you over here.